Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our conference on Jean Améry, the resilience of enlightenment. As is customary in louder. as is customary in this house, we will dispense with in lengthy introductions of our speakers in the interest of time. This is no sign of disrespect. We want to save time for the discussion. Hence, this little conference booklet, which you can find downstairs, or if you're listening to us on the web, you can download it from our website, einsteinforum.de. And welcome to all of the people who are listening on Zoom or watching on Zoom. Uh, we would like to hear your contributions to the discussion as well. Um, for that, use, please use the Q&A function and type it in. We will read them out. Um, this is basically all I have to say. And the word goes to Susan Nyman. before you've done anything. <laughs> Good morning. Sorry, my train was late. Um, this conference was twice postponed by COVID, and I'm sorry that the timing prevented three board members who wanted to join us, Costa Gebat, Philip Kitcher, and Eva Manasa, from being here. I should say, for those of you who don't know, um, our annual June, end of June, beginning of July conference is connected with the annual meeting of our marvelous board of advisors, um, who many of whom will take part. In fact, most of the speakers at this conference are members of our board uh, with a couple of extra invitations. Uh, that is why I've been asked, why are we doing a conference on Jean Marie, one of the great masters of German prose in English? That is the reason we are doing this conference in English. Um, I've been looking forward to doing this conference for a very long time, um, beyond the two uh, dates that were cancelled because of COVID. Uh, for Amory is one of my heroes who's probably influenced my own writing more than anyone else. Writing about Amory is as daunting as writing gets because hardly anyone ever wrote as well as he did. His clarity, passion, irony, courage, and never failing sense of taste made him a master of the German language. Uh, Dominic's translations are superb, but for those of you reading him in English, I would say what George Eliot said about Rousseau, it's worth learning the entire French language just to read him in the original. Uh, so try Amory in German if you can. But it may be the quality of his writing that leads... Sorry? Oh, okay. Gur, can you? Wait just a moment. Can you hear me now in the back? OK. Thank you, Gur. It may be the quality of his writing that leads him to be dismissed as an essayist, or even worse, in German, a publicist. Uh, surely someone that clear and eloquent can't be a real philosopher. For the record, Amory didn't have the money to study at university at all, though he did sit at the feet of the Vienna Circle when he wasn't earning a living as a porter or a barroom pianist. Even more than the sheer beauty of his prose, what prevents many from taking him with the seriousness he earned is something he suggests in one of his last essays by saying all of his works were autobiographical. Questions about the me meaning and nature of the subject, the relation of subjective experience to a reality which is impervious to it, are probably the most central in Amory's work. As with other questions, he didn't address them through the metaphysical abstractions he often considered to be elusive, but radically and directly by taking himself as a subject of each of his major texts. 
But to dismiss the philosophical content of his writing for that reason would be to forget the role of self-examination, not only in the origins of Greek philosophy, but also in the thought of Kant and Wittgenstein, two of the philosophers in whose work Amory was most steeped. He saw the right to use his life as a text, not in any of its remarkable features, but in its representative ones. A life that began in provincial romanticism and led through exile, resistance, torture, and Auschwitz can well be said to have crossed what was crucial in the 20th century, all the more when that life was accompanied by the widest erudition. His knowledge of modern thought was intimate in the most exacting sense of the world, word. Amri's exercise in self-knowledge was successful not only because of the ways in which his life could be seen as archetypical, or because it was conducted with an intelligence exhibited in constant dialogue between the concrete and the theoretical, but also because of his commitment to searing self-criticism. Fond of the word lucid, he had no use for the trendier authentic. What can be shown cannot be said. In describing his writing as autobiographical, he denied that it was personal. Still less can it be called ex exhibitionistic, though it's characteristic of Amory to raise this question himself. Amory's exploration of the self began in the experience of its absolute negation. Long after the war was over, the Auschwitz tattoo that turned Hans Meyer into prisoner 172364 shook him anew every morning and was inscribed on his Vienna tombstone. Amri's assertion of subjectivity is part of a search for self-knowledge that has a very old philosophical tradition. It's also an act of defiance. Amri heard the sweet voice of reason the way some people hear music. Yet his most famous book, Jenseits von Schuld und Sühne, At the Mind's Limits in English, is the most devastating indictment of reason I ever read. Through reflection on the lives of intellectuals at Auschwitz, starting with himself, Amory attempted to describe what happens when pure reason is set against absolute evil. His answer was grim. Absolute evil not only triumphed, but abolished the intellect in very short order. The consolations of philosophy may have worked in a Roman prison, but they withstood only a few weeks at Auschwitz. There is under Gestapo torture, what had been human beings were transformed into sheer flesh. And I quote, <clears throat> a slight pressure by the tool wielding hand is enough to turn the other along with his head in which are perhaps stored Kant and Hegel and all nine sympathy, symphonies and the world as will and representation into a shrilly squealing piglet at slaughter, end quote. The ease with which everything we call mind, soul, or spirit could be destroyed left Amory with amazement he never lost. Reason failed him in Auschwitz on several counts. He'd passed time in the freezing Gores prison camp by composing an anthology of German poetry from memory and co-authoring a tract of neopositivist epistemology. In Auschwitz, the intellect lost its basic quality transcendence, a remembered line of poetry, quote, brought at most pain or derision, then trickled away into a feeling of complete indifference. Nowhere else in the world did reality have as much effective power as in the camp. Nowhere else was reality so real. In no other place did the attempt to transcend it prove so hopeless and shoddy. If the intellect <coughs> failed, <coughs> Uh, sorry, if the intellect was unable to transcend reality, it failed even more miserably in its attempts to comprehend it. Amory suggests it was not only foolish to use reason to understand Auschwitz, that it, but that it may be a moral mistake to try. S'expliquer n'est pas justifié is a maxim that's always used on the defensive. To explain is always the attempt to make something intelligible. And where intelligibility is within reach, justification can't be far behind. Reason could not make Auschwitz more bearable. It should not try to make it comprehensible. Instead, reason was left in the camp with one remaining task, to abolish itself by shattering all its frameworks of belief. What makes it the mind's limits more painful than more graphic or gruesome discretion, descriptions of the concentration camp is that in it, a man of the highest intellect does just what he learned at Auschwitz. 
He uses that intellect to undermine itself and thereby shows the impotence and self-betrayal of reason at the point where it was needed most. Nor does Amory allow himself to find any later meaning in the experience he underwent. Auschwitz, he insisted, did not make its survivors wiser or deeper or more ethically mature. On the contrary, in the terrible thought of the final sentence, quote, the word always dies where the claim of some reality is total. It died for us a long time ago. And we were not even left with the feeling that we must regret its departure. Those of us who are not survivors cannot forget Amory's warning that their most thoughtful efforts to understand the catastrophe will be like a blind man's attempts to understand color. Yet Amory's work is always a call to dialogue. His readers will be forced to question the sentence I quoted, if only because its bitter coldness could only have been formulated by one who regrets the loss of the word so deeply, he cannot really let it go. And this sense is more than confirmed by his later work. If anyone had a right to maintain the impossibility of poetry after Auschwitz, it must be Amory. Not perhaps because of his suffering during the war, but because of his reflections in At the Mind's Limits. If Adorno's aphorism has meaning at all, it would seem to be that expressed in Amory's claim that, quote, to reach out beyond concrete reality with words became before our very eyes a game that was not only a worthless and impermissible luxury, but also mocking and evil. Yet Amory also wrote that Adorno's claim is nonsense. Even more puzzling are passages like these. I quote, what happened that the Enlightenment became a relic of intellectual history, good enough at best for the diligent but sterile exercises of scholars? What sad aberration has brought us to the point where modern thinkers do not dare employ concepts such as progress, humanization, and reason, except in damning quotation marks? One's reaction to such passages, which can be found in most of Amory's later texts, is likely to be surprise. Didn't Amory tell us precisely what happened? Shouldn't he know better than anyone why no modern thinker feels free to use these ideas in good faith? Amory's work seems threatened not by simple contradiction, but by outright antinomy. He maintained that the only hope for fulfilling the one truly human task, giving meaning to the meaningless, lies in the benevolent optimism of the Enlightenment with its constant values of freedom, reason, justice, and truth. Human value, he argues, is to be found in the protest of every occurrence that is unacceptable to reason. This revolt against reality is all that allows us to make history, to create sense and dignity. But if Amory's defense of these ideas is profoundly moving, his demonstration of their antithesis is at least as compelling. For no other author has combined reflection and experience so successfully to convince us that, since Auschwitz, at the very latest, the attempt to create meaning by using reason to confront reality is bound to be forlorn. Now, if antinomies have solutions, they won't be straightforward ones. All of Amory's later work should be seen as a, res as a struggle to resolve this one, and his realization that if the resolution is to be found, it's only in the struggle itself. He's not the only philosopher whose work resists systematization, systematization, summary, or even paraphrase. One wants always just to quote. In Amory, this feature of his style stems not only from the fact that it is so very good, but from his own awareness of the philosophical importance of ambiguity. Without it, not only our empirical reality will be falsified, but even our dreams. Ambiguity and the permanent self-criticism permitted by it allows us to steer a course between dogmatism and nihilism. Like Kant, Amory held these to be twin roots of the same error, the attempt to seek certainty at the cost of freedom. For self-criticism is a hallmark of enlightenment. Amory's understanding of the Enlightenment was as clear as his allegiance to it. The early student of Schlick and the Tractatus became the late critic of Adorno, Foucault, and lesser proponents of what he viewed to be an irrationalism as frivolous as it was fashionable. 
asked to place himself philosophically, Amory called himself an existentialist positivist. As far as I know, he's the only philosopher ever to have done so, but I think I'm going to join. <laughs> his answer underscores his commitment to the rigorous use of thought, especially a stern regard for the distinction between the empirical and the ideal, to examine real questions the Vienna Circle had too quickly dismissed as illusory. Existentialism, he wrote, became for me a wholly personal philosophy of the hunger for life, which had gnawingly returned after so many deaths, so many provisional resurrections. Enlightenment grounded his belief in the principles of the French Revolution, which he viewed as the foundation of a socialism that invoked both utopia and common sense. Enlightenment was a matter of content and practice. It was expressed in the demand that the sharpest critical intelligence be cultivated not in order to dis distance its possessors from the common lot, but to establish the conditions of that intelligence for everyone. One of the many reasons he insisted on the importance of writing clearly. Amory's understanding of enlightenment was classical, finally, in its relentless use of reason to probe the very hardest questions, to strain at the limits of reason itself. His first book examined Auschwitz and torture, and it was followed by treatises on aging and suicide. The list would be daunting were it not for Amory's uncanny ability to write about ruin, decay, and even death itself without a trace of the morbid. His project is imbued with the tone as well as the zeal of the old encyclopedists. As Alfred Anders noted, Amory's discourse on aging is his poem on the, on the Lisbon earthquake. His eye, however, well, he knew the 18th century was on the future and his analysis of the forces courting nihilism today was extraordinarily prescient. I can't decide whether to be glad about this or depressed. Depressed because counter-enlightenment voices which consider themselves to be leftist have only multiplied in the four decades since Amory's death and criticism of those voices have only mostly come from a reactionary right. Now you might think it's time to stop naming political positions after the accidental seating arrangements of the 1789 French Parliament. But lest you think the word left has become so diffuse that it's empty, I offer three principles that should be essential to any standpoint that merits the word left. First, commitment to universalism rather than tribalism. Second, belief in the possibility, though not the inevitability, of progress. And third, belief in a hard distinction between power and justice, even when that distinction is hard to draw in practice. I suspect Adorno does not meet these criteria, and I'm certain Foucault does not. Both of them are godfathers of what's today called the woke left. Their heydays may have been in the 70s and 80s, but they wrote the texts that people who don't read any other philosophy are now assigned in college as classics. Amory, by contrast, often repeated the statement, the heart beats on the left. Or as he put it a year before his death, quote, I try to practice radical humanism, which I situate politically on the left, now as ever, despite the rather painful fact that what counts today as left, today looks prepared to write me off. Though he ruthlessly criticized the tendency among many 60s leftists, including himself, to dismiss atrocities in communist countries as childhood diseases, Kinderkrankheiten, he often quoted Marx, who he viewed as the heir of the classical enlightenment and always called himself a socialist. Indeed, part of his critique of the language used by Foucault, Adorno, and others is that it's far too removed from, indeed incomprehensible, to the ordinary people in whose name the left proposes liberation. As he wrote in a moment of self-criticism, although the concept concrete was a key word in our vocabularies, we became more abstract every day. But Amory's sins against the concrete were nothing compared to Adorno's. As Amory wrote to a friend in 1966, quote, I keep running up against the significant but extremely irritating figure of Adorno for whom, for whom one could wish a thoroughgoing positivistic banality cure. 
<laughs> a banality cure is an idea he takes from the French philosopher Jean-Francois Revel, psychotherapy to eliminate the fear of being banal. A banality cure, presumably, would teach patients to write more clearly. It would also teach them to ask ordinary questions, as Amory did of Foucault. Would Robert Damien, spectacularly tortured to death, have perhaps preferred to be incarcerated in Bentham's Panopticon? Amory did not have to remind his readers he'd been tortured by the Gestapo in considerably less gruesome ways when posing the question. We might also ask of Adorno and Horkheimer's powerful take on Odysseus and the Sirens, so you want he should drown? I love Amory's tirades in favor of banality. Intellectuals' fear of it is not only a political problem insofar as political writing bears any relation to improving the lives of oppressed and suffering people, that fear often masks a problem as old as the story of the emperor's new clothes. Here's Amory after quoting a particularly thorny sentence from Tel Kel, quote, Every reader of modern critical essays is familiar with such sentences. Usually he swallows them with resignation, if only because he doesn't want to be unmasked as backwards, and because he can't believe that so many educated people who accept such verbalisms are resting on nonsense. Here so-called public opinion has a peculiar quality. Everybody squints embarrassedly at everybody else, assuming the other knows better than he does, and lets his own opinion drown in the opinion of other opinions. No one dares suggest a demystifying word, end quote. Uh, if you don't recognize yourself at least once in that passage, you're better than I am. <laughs> Amory's proposed banality cure stems from his commitment to those who are not academics, as technically he was not, as well as to his commitment to the positive principle that statements should be connected to experience, if not always verifiable by it. And it's often forgotten that the Vienna Circle saw itself as a movement committed to left-wing anti-fascist goals, though with the exception of Otto Neurath, their efforts can only seem laughable or tragic today. But Aubrey's critique of what he calls violent anti-banality in which language and thinking come apart is even stronger. He believes that Adorno and Foucault reject banality because they seek a language which intimidates and hypnotizes so that no one will be tempted to translate their statements which when made incomprehensible turn out to be platitudes or worse. Examples of such translations are scattered throughout his philosophical essays. He has quite a lot of fun with Adorno's claim, the banal cannot be true, which he argues is either meaningless, debatable, or empirically false. I wish I'd read jargon of dialectics before I spent hours trying to make sense of dialectic of enlightenment's claim that only the exaggerated is true. Still don't know what that means. <laughs> Aubrey, in short, takes the view expressed in one of my favorite Nietzsche quotes, which as far as I know, he doesn't refer to. People who muddy the waters in order to make them seem deep. Platitudes or worse. Amory says the purveyors of counter enlightenment are actually reactionaries without realizing it. There are, uh, he doesn't fill out this claim in detail, so I will try to do so myself. There are jibes at Adorno's Hegelianism, and it was Hegel, after all, who tried to weld the real and the rational. For Amory, and Kant, by the way, it's reason's revolt against reality that constitutes freedom, and with it any progress we ever make against real oppressive structures. Let's look at Adorno's famous claim that poetry after Auschwitz would be barbarism. For Adorno's line spells not only the end of poetry, but of every form of culture, since it did not prevent and cannot comprehend the Holocaust, as Amory showed so well in Jenseits von Schuld und Sühne. Adorno had great respect for that book, which he cited both in his Vorlesungen zur Metaphysik and Negative Dialectik. One wonders what he would have thought of Amory's other essays, most of which were written after Adorno's death. 
Was Adorno's determination to view Auschwitz as the end of history, or at least the end of cultural history, a form of penance for the fact that he spent the war in Santa Monica? That's the sort of question that Amari would have asked about himself, mutatis mutandis, though he'd have had the good taste not to ask it of Adorno. I suspect there's something in that, but it slides into this kind of psychobiographical inquiry most thinkers steer clear of and, in fact, will never know. What's missing in Dialectic of Enlightenment is any hint of orientation in thinking, which Kant called the task of philosophy. Though founded in order to blend Freudian and Marxist insights with empirical sociology into a radical form of thinking, critical theory can do nothing but criticize. Amari, by contrast, wrote the task of the intellectual is to convert Freudian discontent with culture into a utopian striving towards universal values. Not only does Adorno fail to do this, he suggests there's no way to go on at all and seals it with the aphorism that's way better in the original, es gibt kein richtiges Leben im Falschen, um, you can sort of translate that into English as there's no right way to live when everything is wrong, but es gibt kein richtiges Leben im Falschen. Es sounds better. Um, like Odysseus, for Adorno, we can only sail on by muting the force of culture, becoming no better than capitalist robber barons in the process. Here's Amory's summary of the impression left by dialectic of enlightenment. Quote, enlightenment, a bourgeois mystification. Reason, the evil instrumentality of unjust, outdated forms of production. Humaneness, the pretext of the third estate which presented its particular interests as universal values so it could exploit the fourth estate in good conscience. Progress, the frenzied obsession with productions and profit of a bourgeoisie that has subjugated the working class and with them the earth, end quote. Add a remark about enlightenment as the source of colonialism, and uh, you hear the kind of talk, have the kind of talk I hear nearly every day, not only from students, but from the current gatekeepers of German culture. Dialectic of enlightenment contains some great one-liners and a powerful critique of the culture industry. But by the time they've worked their way through it, most people conclude that enlightenment at best is entirely impotent and at worst close kin to the Marquis de Sade. After a couple of seminars, I actually decided to stop teaching the book to undergraduates. Maybe graduate students <laughs> can handle it. Mm. If Amory is hard on Adorno, he's even harder on Foucault, whom he thinks important enough to recommend reading. But it's indispensable, he writes, that as readers bring inner resistance, the determination not to be charmed or intimidated. Openness in the face of what has never been heard or seen is necessary, but it must always be corrected by the demand for rigor. Every sentence by this writer must be strictly checked for its logical sense or meaning. Even more important for Amory is Foucault's talk of the end of the human. As Amory sees it, for Foucault and other structuralists, the system is everything, the human being nothing, even as he notes that the system in such writers remains only vaguely defined. If structure is everything, where's the space for human agency? Indeed, Amory writes, in Foucault there is hardly any causality in the historical process at all. But, as Amory puts it, the human being as historical and moral being is only free when he's able to break out of the panzer of structures. He's proved often enough that this is possible. But Foucault is not interested in examples of liberation, largely because he believes that instances of liberation turn out to be subtler forms of oppression. There's no joking with this man, writes Amory. Mit diesem Mensch ist nicht zu spaßen. Demystification is his unrelenting business. The destruction of humanistic progressive illusions is his burning desire. Now, no one will deny the value of de deconstructing some humanistic illusions. Amory writes, quote, only a fool would deny that the prison improvements of the 18th and 19th century were 
also an expression of bourgeois capitalists striving for profit, as if the powers that were didn't also consider that a halfway humanely treated prisoner has better working potential than one who is starving. But it's an aberration to describe things as if this humanization were only the result of profit and production, end quote. I imagine those of you who teach today's students hear this move about once a week. Um, any unmasking of one attempt to make progress is seen to undermine them all. It's a move, by the way, that's as old as Thrasymachus' attack on Socrates in the first book of the Republic. An elementary course in logic, even without a banality cure, could show the fallacy. No wonder that Foucault's anthropologies leave nothing to do but more anthropology, for nothing else is possible with the possible exception of language games. Let me end the sketch of Amarillo on Foucault by pointing to his dis discussion of structuralism in Unmeisterlicher Wanderjahre, where he wrote, the person for whom you fought was your subjectivity. Amory's autobiographical writing moves between first, second, and third person speech. Speaking to himself in this eloquent passage, he reminds the reader that anyone who is totally dehumanized in Auschwitz knows the human when he sees it. At the end of Jenseits, he wrote of the difficulty of becoming human again. Auschwitz prisoners were denied every form of subjectivity down to their own names. How should an intellectual who survived that celebrate the death of the subject. One reason for calling Adorno, Foucault, and their followers ultimately re reactionary is just this, quote, doesn't it occur to them that their irrationalism serves the interests of the powerful, the publishers, the media czars, the circulation obsessed newspapers, just as effectively as the soulful outpourings of the conservative revolutions once did, end quote. It's clearly in the interests of those who hold the power to deny voting and workers' rights, not to mention legal abortion, that the left should exhaust itself in obscure questions about language and language rules. But even more importantly, what Adorno and Foucault have in common and which serves a worldview that is ultimately reactionary is their inability to see any form of progress. It's not an accident that most of those who would have called themselves leftists a generation ago now call themselves progressives. Fear is a factor. In a world where the residues of the Cold War have yet to be examined, much less discarded, leftist sounds too close to socialist and socialist too close to the state socialism of Eastern Europe for comfort. Fear notwithstanding, the shift to the word progressive makes more sense than other terms, for there's no deeper difference between left and right than the idea that progress is possible. It wasn't an idea found in traditional conservative thought, which viewed history at best as static or circular, and at worst as a sad, slow decline from a mythic golden age. A better world for conservatives could only be found in the afterlife. To stand on the left is to stand behind the idea that men and women can work together to make significant improvements in the real conditions of their own and others' lives. It's an idea that's often caricatured as the belief that progress is necessary. Many passages of Hegel and Marx do make that claim, and history has showed it to be false. But to rightly deny that progress is necessary is not to deny that it's possible if possibility depends on the free actions of human beings working together. If progress in this sense is possible, so is regress, <clears throat> and history has seen both. Give up the possibility of progress, and politics becomes nothing but a struggle for power. So how did Michel Foucault become the godfather of the woke generation? Well, everything in his performance screamed rebel, he wrote books that glorified those on society's margins, the outlaw, the madman. And decades before anybody began to imagine marriage equality, he was openly, transgressively gay. The style was revolutionary, but the message was as reactionary as anything Edmund Burke or de Maistre ever wrote. Indeed, Foucault's vision was gloomier than theirs. 
Earlier conservative thinkers were content to warn that all hell would break loose should revolutionaries contest the traditions that carry societies along for better and worse. Foucault's warnings were more insidious. You think we make progress towards practices that are kinder, more liberating, more respectful of human dignity, all goals of the left? Take a look at the history of an institution or two. What looked like steps towards progress turn out to be more sinister forms of repression. All of them are ways in which the state extends its domination over our lives. Once you see now every step forward becomes a more subtle and powerful step towards total subjection, you're likely to conclude that progress is illusory. If you want to take down for hopes for progress, it's a stroke of genius of Foucault's uh, to target one of the Enlightenment's first and most successful demands, the abolition of torture. Like most progressive demands, it was never fully realized. George W. Bush brought torture back to Guantanamo, and it's more or less openly practiced in many part of the, parts of the world today. If progress is possible, so is regress. Still, once standard practices like drawing and quartering, breaking on the rack, and autos da fe have rightly been banned as barbaric. Executions in the US are rarely contested for all the reasons one might contest the death penalty, but on the grounds that the medical means of execution by injection may cause too much pain. Discipline and punish the work of Foucault's most often taught to undergraduates begins with a horrific description of the slow death by torture of one Robert Damien, which remains in memory when the convoluted argument that follows is forgotten. As ancient Greek writers told us, it's easy to feel mesmerized by spectacles of violence that also repel us. Argument or not, by the time we've, we've finished reading Discipline and Punish, we can easily be convinced that modern forms of incarceration are worse than a system in which six horses and executioner's sword publicly dismember a living human body. Worse? If it were only that simple. Foucault wasn't the first to fudge the distinction between normative and descriptive claims, but he made it common practice among legions of theorists who call themselves critical. Nowhere does he actually claim that bringing back drawing and quartering would be better, nor does he hint towards any proposal that might make the lives of murderers or people with severe mental illness better in any way. When pushed for a solution, Foucaultians reply that their business is archaeology related to history, a field notoriously averse to making normative claims. Yet his vision of history is full of normative implications. Amory wrote, he refuses to moralize, though moralizing is written with sympathetic ink into his entire work. If we cannot acknowledge that some progress has been made in the past, we will never find the will to make more. Thus, work that consists in deconstructing all previous attempts to make progress is not just defeatist, though it is that. It has no claim to belong to the left. But it's a stance I encounter often, including among my own children. Lately, I've wondered if we're living in a general, generational confrontation much sharper than the one my generation began with claims like, hope I die before I get old. <laughs> For the record, my generation was uh, never one of my favorite songs. For what I notice sometimes are not just differences in belief or emotion, but real differences of perception, particularly in any question touching on the possibility of progress. Then again, I'm not sure it's generational because I see the same differences in publishers or cultural managers of my own generation. And then I'm heartened by Amari's 1978 comment that, quote, not a few of us had no other thought than the obsessive desire not to lose the connection to the youth, <coughs> quote, and adds that neither youth nor age per se is any guarantee of foresight or wisdom. We elders, he continues, were miserable teachers, a phenomenon I've seen when professors refrain from correcting simple errors for fear their students will dismiss them as insufficiently woke. 
Amory urges us instead to return to the patient, unheroic work of enlightenment. This work, Amory shows, can preserve both sides of a conflict in all their urgency, making clear there's no middle ground without deception. Only by acknowledging the force of competing claims and moving between them can reason be kept alive. Amory shows this most clearly in the conflict between enlightenment and nihilism, but it's equally evident in his discussions of Marxism and humanism, analytic and continental philosophy, in his explorations of the demands of reason and emotion, theory and practice, the political and the erotic. His anti-Hegelianism Hegelianism is far too decided to seek unity in those forces. Here, unity would entail compromise, and his thought is uncompromising. The search is rather one for balance. Such balance is always precarious. Perhaps it was only the thorough destruction of his own sense of being at home in the world that allowed Amari to admit the pervasiveness of deep disharmony. We are not, we and the world are not in tune. Like Charles Bovary's love for the faithless Emma, Amory's love for reason was profound enough to sustain even the knowledge of its betrayal. And his death by his own hand does not change this understanding. Indeed, it perhaps affirms that he would have chosen to live as he died, freely, consciously, consciously in the conviction that the belief in the human as the goal of the human doesn't let itself be crushed by conceptual contradiction, end quote. If someone who saw and understood the very worst that human history had to offer, who are we all to abandon hope? Thank you. So I have just used um, my privilege as the organizers of this conference to, to um, go over the time limit. I figured a general introduction to Amory, um, as I see him, might be helpful. And I'm going to use my privilege as organizer and director of this house to um, give us a little more extra time for discussion. Questions? Mario Kessler was first. Okay, thank you, Mary. thank you very much. Can you hear me, folks? Okay. Susan, thank you very much for this uh, firework of idea, ideas as expected. And I, 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 I wonder, was there a starting point for, for a Mary's uh, defense of in, in enlightenment? And I see it much before uh, he, wrote, he, wrote a, he wrote about Auschwitz. One of his, uh, his earliest, earliest books, his second one, it's a set, set of critiques of uh, or portraits of jazz musicians in Banneses Jazz, fasc 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 fascinated by jazz. I don't know whether this had ever been translated into, into English. He wrote it simultaneously when he wrote his first uh, his his first long long, long critique about uh, Franz Fanon black skin white masks. Uh, later he changed his attitude, but this is but this is beyond this discussion. My question my question is: uh, Do you see any any um, connection between Amery's uh, uh, let's say love for jazz, his 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 early defense of American civil rights, yeah, because because here in the 1950s here he, he reflects very much the, the the beginning civil rights movement and uh, and his later militant defense of the of the Enlightenment because all the principles of the Enlightenment, which means struggle against struggle against colonialism, ethnic equality, is very much uh, explained in this early book. Uh, thank you. I mean, I think the, the um, most important answer to that question is, you know, once enlightenment, always enlightenment. That is, you, you know, um, and it's clear from his, um, not just from his early 
political interventions, but also, I mean, from what one knows about, I mean, this is one of the most erudite writers I have ever read in my life. I know enough to know that I only get about half of his allusions to texts, um, you know, of, of, I get most of the allusions to the classic Enlightenment text, but there's some of the allusions to um, German and particularly Austrian literature that I just, okay, that's, you know, he just read more than um, anybody knew, and he did it all on, by himself. So, of course, um, this is someone who all his life, um, you know, in, was imbued with certain principles of the Enlightenment, but, you know, the direct, the direct defense happened, you know, most clearly after his Auschwitz book. So, you know, but uh, again, I don't think, I, I think you're, it, people, <laughs> it's one of the great, Two cats, two kinds of people. Questions, you know. There are two kinds of people. What are doing? I do think there are two kinds of people. Um, you know, as far as enlightenment and anti-enlightenment go, I just that's um, how it is. Next question, Dominic Bonfilio. Hi, thank you, Susan, for the talk. Um, so, one thing that's striking about Amari and that you got it in your, in your lecture, is that okay. So one thing that you point out in the lecture is that despite being thoroughly dehumanized at Auschwitz, Amari maintained his trust in enlightenment and in thinking in a way. But I wanted to ask how you um, read the last passage in at the mind's limits, and I'm, I'm still puzzling over this, and I'm not sure what to make of it. He says, I'm just gonna just cite it here. And yet the time in the camp was not entirely without value for us, and when I say us, I mean the non-religious and politically independent intellectuals. For we brought with us the certainty that remains ever unshakable, that for the greatest part, the intellect is a ludus, and that we are nothing more, or better said, before we entered the camp, we were nothing more, than hominus ludentis. With that, we lost a good deal of arrogance, of metaphysical conceit, but also quite a bit of our naive joy in the intellect and what we falsely imagined was a sense of life. And I was trying to understand what he is getting at with ludus. I mean, ludus is game. It could also be play. And I'm not sure if that's a kind of idea of the intellect as a mere game or the sense that there is a kind of playful openness to the mind, right? That actually can, I don't know, maybe a kind of, um, I don't know, something that can, through play, remain more resilient in a way. Um, I, it's a nice thought, um, Dominic. Um, you know, the reason why I went into that riff at the end on anti-Hegelianism and, you know, not trying to bring two sides of a contradiction or an antinomy together is that I wouldn't say he maintained trust in the Enlightenment. Um, not at all. I think he really thought there's just no alternative, you know? Everything else is worse. If we're going to maintain um, you know, any sense of humanity moving forward in any way. That's what we've got. But I think that, I mean, that, that essay, and anybody who hasn't read At the Mind's Limits, um, just the first 19 pages of the book by the same name should read it. Um, you know, it's, I, I, he was writing that, he was working on that around the time of the Auschwitz trials, okay? Which were the first trials, uh, held concentration camp trials held in Germany and they ended rather miserably. That is, they ended with, um, you know, sort of German public opinion being able to say, well, there were a few bad apples and, um, you know, we, the rest of us didn't know what was happening, okay? So it was 
those trials were a blow. It's not, it's not just that, you know, he lived through the thing itself, but Germany hadn't even begun its Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, okay? They were just all um, happy to say, few bad apples, we didn't know, that's it. And I think he was in despair. I mean, he writes about that at other places in that book. Um, at, you know, how in the first few years after the war, he and his surviving comrades felt they were on the right side of history and that the world was, you know, recognizing with them and recognizing evil with them. And, uh, you know, that sense was collapsing with the reaction. So I don't actually, I, I mean, I like you trying to find something hopeful in that last line, but given how he talks about play, you know, at, elsewhere in that essay is sort of ridiculous, I don't, I don't think so. I think it is a grim and jarring book in which he tries to set out one side of this antinomy and then spends a lot of the rest of his life trying to set out the other side without trying to unite them at all. Peter Gallison is next. Uh, thank you, Susan, for a wonderful commentary. There's so much in, in what you've said <clears throat> that, that, that I, I very much agree with. I just read the Minds and book last night, so it's fresh, fresh to me, um, which I'd not read before, and it is remarkable. Um, the one place where I don't, I didn't read it the same way you did, or I didn't read it the same way you did in, in, at the podium, but closer to what you just said, namely at the podium, you took the view that he really did have a certain faith in progress and that this was built into his concept of the Enlightenment. In the comments that you just made in response to Dominique, uh, you, 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 know, you, you talked about his self-criticism of thinking about progress being on the right side of history, having the world in back of him from 45 to 62, 63, uh, but then he saw, he saw it with his rigorous, the positivist side of him, uh, the, the empirical side of him, as illusory. And that, you know, he said there was a day pass given in Germany against uh, anti-Semitism, but he saw it as temporary. Uh, it was already gone back to normal, so to speak, normal anti-Semitism in many other European countries. I think he was quite, there was nothing I thought particularly either optimistic or progress oriented about his views about these things. Um, and I, there I think that the way I read the book is also not just the positivist side, and in this he shares a positivism with Foucault. He's very critical of Foucault because of Foucault's, he doesn't say this, but historical structuralism. Uh, and Foucault's not interested in what happened on day six of the French Revolution. He's, in, he's not interested in these moments of change that fascinate historians. He says most of history is fairly static and our ways of reasoning need to be understood empirically. And he, Amory, has a really rigorous positivism too in not looking, he, I think he sees a, a historical arc of history as a kind of metaphysical faith. And I don't think he has much place for that. Where, what I think takes its place for him and that gives the work a commitment is the existential part of existential positivism. And if there's anything that one takes from the Sartrean version of existentialism, it's the role of giving yourself projects, right? You assign yourself a project and, um, and then meaning emerges from that self-assignation. And I think that he sees, you know, when he gets to the camps, I don't think he sees reason as saving him. He says a long passages about reason is incapable of dealing with this and, you know, we, we just have to get through the, the, the most clarifying moment that he sees, the redemptive moment is when he punches his guard in the face. Uh, you know, it's not a, I don't think there's, I don't think there's much enlightenment in his, in, in, there as a, as, a, as, as a mode of salvation. Uh, and then afterwards he gives himself further tasks and I think he sees a kind of hopefulness in, in that com c continuing assignment to himself of tasks to do, of, of, of wit bearing witness to what he saw, 
of a scrupulous honesty and empiricism about, about this, about a non-metaphysical way, not looking to God or country or uh, the, you know, bending the arc of history. I, I don't think any of that, I think he has as little interest in those things as Foucault. Uh, so I, I, I do think there is something hopeful and in, in the work, despite its moments of tremendous despair, and that's in the rigorous assignment of our responsibilities, even knowing our limitations, the frailty of, our, of what we do, uh, the judgment of others. Uh, and I think there, there, there is something hopeful, optimistic, but it's not, it's not a metaphysics of, of uh, the arc of history bending towards no, rightness. No, 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 no. Um, I, yeah, I agree um, with all, almost everything you said, Peter. Um, and the only, the only thing that I would not diverge but, but expand, look, I, I don't think there's any hope in At the Mind's re uh, Limits. I think it is, it is one of the most despairing books that I have ever read, okay? Um, so entirely agreed about that. And what's so interesting is that in the Amari literature, I mean, there's not a whole lot of it. When people talk about Amari, everybody's read that book. Um, some people have read uh, the, the Defense of Suicide and the a book about aging. Nobody talks about the Enlightenment stuff, which is why I wanted to do this conference, okay? Um, and I don't think, of, I, you're absolutely right, I don't think he believes in any kind of metaphysics at all, um, and certainly not a metaphysical view of, of um, the, uh, you know, the arc of history, et cetera, et cetera. I think he has something like Kant's notion of rational faith, which, I mean, Kant does both with regard to God and then later with regard to the idea of progress, moral progress in history. And it's just this, and it's a maxim that I try to hang on to all the time, and um, you know, it gets harder and harder. Um, we have absolutely no way of knowing what the future holds, okay? If we don't b hang on to the idea that it's possible to make progress in history, we will never have the will to make any ourselves, and, we, and a fortiori, the world will get worse, okay? Um, so, and and that's, a, that's a moral obligation, it's not certainly not a statement of metaphysics, it's not, certainly not a statement of fact, it's just, um, it's all we have. Um, the world will get worse if we don't believe that it's possible to make it better, period. Uh, now we have a question from a Zoom participant, I believe. Uh, Dominic is gonna read it. Uh, so this is from Yarkov Halik. Um, there's a, one question and a comment. The question is, um, what I don't understand about Amory is that if he was really so devoted to enlightenment, why is it that he does not seem to have any desire to teach? Um, perhaps because of his trauma, he was unable to connect with the younger generation. Um, he seems to have processed his own trauma through his vitriolic satire of figures such like Adorno and Foucault. Um, and then the comment was the idea that um, Amari was an existentialist uh, empiricist, um, is, uh, quote, probably the closest one can get to that Jewish irony and optimism that has allowed us Jews to survive for so many thousands of years. Um. Uh, thank you for the comment. Um, and yes, um, it is uh, one of the, uh, in that book, he also has an essay about the necessity and possibility of being a Jew and the fact that he was not brought up in any Jewish sense whatsoever and only the Nazis turned him into a Jew. But actually, um, there are lots of things in his work and it's particularly the irony that strikes me as very Jewish. As to the first question, um, he didn't have a college degree, you know? I mean, teaching anything. <laughs> was not a viable uh, um, job for him. The only way that he could earn, a, I, don't, I don't know anywhere where he talks about 
uh, not wanting to teach or finding teaching hopeless or uh, not being connected to the next generation. I don't know of anything that um, relates to that. On the contrary, he is connected to that generation. He writes about Marilyn Monroe and uh, jazz, as uh, as Mario pointed out. So it's it's not being disconnected from popular culture, which he's quite interested in. It's being specifically furious at the two philosophical uh, trends that are just beginning to take shape that he thinks are deeply wrong. But he didn't have a, he had no university education. So where is he, he couldn't even teach high school. Um, so it just simply wasn't a career option. Thank you. Any more questions, please? David Schumann. Uh, first of all, Susan, um, thank you. It was a really magisterial um, presentation. Another one of many that I've heard in this room from you. Um, but throughout it, I want to say that I was haunted um, by the fact of his suicide, or you might say his two suicides, the one that succeeded and the one that didn't. And uh, you allowed yourself to refer to that towards the very end, and you said rightly that we're not in a position to judge it. But I was wondering, given the fact that he wrote an essay about it, and then given the fact that he finally did it, if you might be able to say something more about that in connection with this theme that has come up so strongly, the ambivalence of... Um, progress or hopefulness or anything like that? So I actually think Peter, who did know Amory, is going to talk a bit about his suicide tomorrow. And uh, so I would, since, since um, I envy Peter for actually having met him in Vienna, um, I, I would leave that question for tomorrow. But I will say a couple of things because, of course, there's no way you can think about him without thinking about that. First of all, um, he does say in the book about suicide that, you know, we're always outside of the world of the person who commits suicide and no outsider really understands it. And I, I think there's something right about that. Um, there were some personal complications that I know a little bit about, some personal struggles, both professional and private. Um, I also, frankly, I was, <laughs> I was once um, invited to give a talk in Salzburg and the person who picked me up, it was at a hotel, and the person who picked me up said, oh, we're, um, we're going to the hotel where Amory committed suicide. And I said, oh my god, because Amory has really uh, long been a hero of mine. So of course I changed the talk a little bit to say something about that. I hope I'm not offending anybody who likes Salzburg, but I have to say that on this and other occasions, the few occasions that I've been there, I felt that there was a real hostility when I mentioned Amory. I mean, you felt like kind of that fucking Jew. Um, again, do we have to hear about the Holocaust? Um, and um, I, I could almost imagine if you were teetering between killing yourself and not killing yourself. <laughs> that a night or two in that hotel, it's a nice hotel, um, <laughs> a night or two in that hotel in Salzburg could really uh, give you the last push. You know, but, but again, and that's what I tried to say at the very end, I, I really do see um, Amory's entire work and life as this struggle between uh, you know, despair, uh, you know, nihilism and enlightenment, um, between you know, despair and hope, and not ever coming down in, in some you know, absolutist way 
on the side of either precisely for the reasons that Peter says he's just ruthlessly honest and self-critical and he know you know he can think of every objection that you could make to any of his positions before you make it yourself um, so I I see him intellectually and I'm projecting this into his personal life and decisions, but since he gives us so much autobiographical writing, I sort of feel, okay, um, I get to do this. I see him struggling the whole time between this sense of despair and trying to hang on to the enlightenment, and one night he couldn't anymore. I mean, another night, you're right, he tried once and didn't succeed. I'd like to abuse my position sorry, as sorry. the chair to ask the last question, if I may. Okay, then we take up for this. Sorry, didn't see you there. Hi, Susan, Marsha Pally. We used to run into each other. I haven't seen you in a while, and it's a w wonderful to hear your beautiful writing again. Um, I, I, I wanted to throw out a comment regarding this struggle between optimism, metaphysics, despair, and so on, and that's the distinction between optimism and hope that people like Catherine Keller insist on, where optimism is some kind of, as a somewhat naive certitude or expectation that things are going to get better, and hope being the hope that things can improve, looking squarely in the face of the reality that doesn't appear to be bettering. And so I, I wonder if that distinction is helpful in this. In this well, thank discussion. you, Marsha. I make that distinction all the time in my own work. And you'll note that mm. I never used the word optimism in this talk because I think Voltaire was actually right about optimism. Um, optimism is not a statement that we know about. It was a statement of fact, right? Um, and it, there, it's a silly position. Um, so, um, yeah, I have a whole chapter on, on the hope and optimism in my book, Moral Clarity. So, yeah, I only use the word hope and not optimism. Perhaps one last question, if I may. Please. Um, you've quoted quite extensively from the 1978 essay on Foucault, which appeared in its height. Um, I have a slightly different impression when reading the, this essay and it involves uh, a dispute about suicide which is not mentioned in this essay um, I was getting to it by way of timeline this is 1978 and the books he's reviewing if you like are 12 years old one is six years old why is he writing about Foucault again is that really a serious theoretical engagement at all? And I read it to be an essay about what the left should do in reaction to the suicide of Ulrike Meinhof only months before. Um, because there, both Foucault and Amory are in a sense involved. Um, Foucault is leading a campaign um, to grant asylum to one of the lawyers representing Meinhof and Bader. Uh, he fled to France. He's mentioned in the essay. First line, Klaus Croissant. Um, at the same time, Croissant is leading an international commission to examine Ulrike Meinhof's suicide and to prove that it was actually a murder, that the system had killed Ulrike Meinhof. And this commission wrote to Amory to join them. And he declined. He said, that's not the way to go. And he even publicly defended the Federal Republic of Germany in a book edited by the federal president. That something like this would not be happening in Germany. And that we should accept that it was a suicide and that it was a free act of an incarcerated woman, and he basically says, Foucault has nothing to say about that. And that is the ending of that article. I just wanted to let you know about I that. can only thank you for that, Martin. I didn't know that, and I didn't think about the particular historical 
context. I mean, one thing I can say, you know, just, um, sorry, we're gonna? Yeah, just not to be misunderstood. Ulrike Meinhof's suicide in, in May 77 has nothing to do with Amelie's book. He's just finished it. So it, that was not in any way uh, part of his thinking when writing the book. But there he goes, publishes the central part of the book in Mercur in July 77, and just a month before, or two months before, Ulrike Meinhof takes her life, and that's dominating the debate. Okay. Very interesting um, and helpful. And all I can say is I didn't know it and I, I wasn't thinking about it. Um, you know, why does he write three essays on Foucault, you know, at different, you know, fairly succession after Foucault first became, you know, uh, known and read and translated and people were talking about it. I mean, the interesting thing is that I think um, Foucault is um, always relevant ever since he, holy shit, um, ever since he, um, you know, began, I was, somebody suggested uh, when I was talking about Foucault the other day, or the other month, um, that he wasn't a serious force anymore and the heyday was over and all of that, and you know, to which I said what I said in the talk. Sorry, he's what his heyday was in the 70s and 80s, but he's what every kid reads, at least in every liberal arts college in uh, the Anglo-American university system. Um, as the classic they have to know, in the same way that people who didn't read any philosophy read Sartre, say, um, in my generation. Um, so I think it's relevant for him to write three uh, pieces on Foucault any time, but you're the historian, so I appreciate the historical contextualization. Thank you. I'd like you all to join me in thanking Susan. And next up is Moshe Halbotha. Again, no disrespect that we don't introduce our guests. You find all you need to know in this booklet. Well, thank, thanks, Susan, for, for the invitation to participate in this symposium. And also thanks for actually leading us express, uh, explicitly away from Auschwitz and torture so we can, uh, we can discover another world of Ameri and actually put his other essays in a far broader context in the way you did it. And, um, and I'm, you have covered a lot of, a lot of the subjects I want to address, um, uh, which actually helps Sorry. me. No, 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 not at all, actually. I thank you because you have done much better work than I would have done anyhow. So uh, really, it's, um, uh, and, and what I would like to do, therefore, I would want to focus on one aspect of the Enlightenment as, as Amelie understood it, and then I light what I believe is another inner tension discovered in his work. Um, so we have the theme of reason and we have the theme of progress. And then there's the whole issue of, as you explicitly said, I think very powerfully and beautifully, uh, the tension of those themes with his essays in, in, in On the Mind's Limit. I mean, reason and progress, and, uh, and I want to focus on a, on a third dimension of the Enlightenment, and then follow it with another internal tension, and that's, that's what I would like to do. And you have mentioned it, but didn't focus on it, and my focus will be on the concept of the human. I think, I think part of the achievements of the Enlightenment, which Amiri also thought, maybe the most precious of them, is the idea of the human. 
And by the idea of the human, I mean the following, uh, philosophically speaking. I mean that our moral vocabulary shouldn't be reduced to associational language, shouldn't be owned and controlled and exhausted by associational categories, be it the tribe, the nation, the race, the religious groups, etc. But humans as such, with no other attribute, uh, are subjects of robust moral concern. So for example, just to give an example of what I mean by associational. So you, um, you take a right like the right to vote, right? The right to vote is not a human right. It's not given to a person due to his or her humanity, but it has to do with another feature or another attribute of that person, which is citizen. Humans, you don't have a human right to vote. It's a civic right to vote. You want every human to be a citizen. That's true. Uh, but it's not a human right per se. So, uh, so we, we live in a world of, uh, uh, where, where commitments are drawn, are, are, are derived associationally speaking, and uh, a thrust, a deep thrust of the, of the Enlightenment is to do away with the control of associational categories on our moral and political world. So humans, qua humans, have to be granted moral concern, have to be subjects of moral concern. Now, I want to add to this uh, two things that are very important this issue. One, they, they ought to be robust. I mean, it's not a thin commitment. You might say, well, every culture might, not every culture, but many cultures say, we don't cannibalize people, uh, humans, right? Uh, well, that's not robust enough, right? We, you, mean, you mean a whole full scale of robust moral commitment to human, and also very important for that world, very important, is the idea that it sets strong limits on associational claims and loyalties. I mean, this, uh, uh, this, um, uh, this realm of the human and the commitment to a human, quite human, sets serious limitations on different associational interests and quests and loyalties. Now, now I mean, we can, we can do a history of philosophy here in terms of how enlightenment, there are different types of enlightenments vis-a-vis -vis the category of the human, be it Locke with a, a human that is naturally endowed with rights and then the Kantian version of of the human that has to do with the capacity to self-transcend and autonomy that grants dignity, or, or in later variations of, of, of enlightenment in the, in the thought of utilitarians, be it Bentham and others. What's important in the utilitarian thinking is that units of utility are equally distributed among humans as such. You don't give more way to utility of someone who are you associated with in different modes. So we have, we have the category of the human, which is a, a major moral and political achievement. It has, a, it has a broader history, it has a prior history, but it's a very strikingly enlightenment mode. And, uh, but it's a very fragile, and precious achievement, very vulnerable. The category of the human is one of the most morally vulnerable categories that there are, very difficult to maintain. And I think one thing that we learn from, from Amery's response to the counter-enlightenment is his, his, his strong attempt at preserving that category, at maintaining its moral force. And basically, I see three fronts here that he is tackling uh, when he understands how vulnerable is this concept of the human. Uh, the first is the clear context, which is racism, ultranationalism in different forms, right? There is, there is, the category of human doesn't exist. It's us and them. 
uh, whether it's, it's uh, hierarchically described or oppositionally described, that doesn't matter. It's just us and them. There is no place to, to the human. And um, you think about ultranationalism. Well, ultranationalism is marked by the fact that the associational identity of the nation is such that it undermines the equality of rights of minorities within the nation in a consistent way, including attacking all those institutions that are there to defend it. The courts, the press, um, um, you know, um, civic societies, etc., etc. So we have this phenomenon of, uh, of, of uh, and also, I mean, one other feature of ultranationalism is that the interests of the nations are not, are not in any ways contained or constrained by humanistic values. You know, the nation has to pursue its interests liberales, you know, before everything, putting America first, etc. So, uh, so we have that challenge that, Foucault, that um, Amiri is very interested in understanding how that challenge makes the category of the human so fragile. Then we have the second challenge that comes from his very ambivalent relationship with Marxism. Though he sees Marx as a, as a figure, as an, as an offspring of the Enlightenment, he doesn't think that Marxists are offspring of the Enlightenment. And, uh, um, and by the way, his relationship with Sartre, you mentioned, you mentioned the Bader Meinhof case. Uh, he was very upset with Sartre, uh, wanting to interview and meet and, and Bader. He thought, was this kind of, he was such an admirer of him. And he thought it was a major failure, moral failure on his part. But, but, but uh, what you have is a class structure. Right, it's either either the working class or the bourgeois, and it's not clear for him that Marxists have any idea of what the human is, including the reinterpretation, the reinterpretation of the Enlightenment as a kind of a ploy, as a universal uh, conspiracy, as a conspiracy of the bourgeoisie to talk the universal language in order to maintain their domination over the working class. You actually quoted the very powerful lines of it. So that's the third, uh, that's the third front where, where the idea of the human is so fragile. It's a sort of, you have it from the right, you have it from the Marxist left. And then Foucault and the post-structuralists. And, the, uh, and he sees in them, in some ways, no less dangerous attack on the concept of the human. Uh, uh, and that has to do with, with the idea that um, um, the human subject is an invented arti artifact, right? Um, um, in terms of the, the Foucauldian project, it's uh, invented with a science so we can control. It's a kind of a very complex dialectic. So, um, I, I, my, my thinking about and I would say here I feel more affinity with the Amiri's project than the issue of progress, though I, you, have, you have pointed to the ambivalence of, of this idea. Uh, but he, he's, uh, he's dedicated to defend that precious, fragile category of the human. As he perceives under immense attack from different directions, as I said, from those three directions that are carry immense intellectual political weight, and he sees them as thoroughly dangerous. And it's not, it's a dangerous moment. It's a moment where stakes are so high for him in preserving that category of the human. Now, um, I want to, what I would like to do, um, and what I would like to do is point to what I believe is a, a kind of an internal tension in Amiri that adds, in some ways paradoxically, a deeper and more complex fragility to the concept of the human. And that has to do not with the external front that he is confronting as counter-enlightenment, but his own experience and biography, and his own thinking coming out of his own biography. Uh, that has to do with, I think, 
two very great achievements of his as a thinker. One is the concept of home. Home. He has this essay, how much home does a person need? Home, I'm not sure is a good translation. Heimat. In the Hebrew they translate moledet, which is homeland. Whatever. Uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, one is the concept of home. I think it's a very deep, very deep essay. And the other one is the idea of resentment. And they, and they both, and they both, and they both survive, I would say, under a general title of the concept of exile, which I think is one of the deepest thinkers on the category of exile. And this is a category I'm interested in. Different thing, actually there is a powerful book by Yitzhak Ber. I think one of the, uh, one of the latest book published here in Germany in, uh, from, from Jewish studies called Galut, uh, the, uh, Exile, very, very, very beautiful essay. Uh, so I, I, wanna, I wanna explain uh, his ideas on, on these two topics and then the internal tension they raise with the very idea of the concept of a human, I think, I think a very subtle tension and complex adding to, in some ways, the fragility of that category. Okay, so um, now in this essay about home and how much home, heimat, does a person need, he has an interesting take on what home is, and now I'm, I'm warning a little bit that it's on my, my own slight reconstruction, I hope. It's trying to improve a little bit on a great author, okay? So I would say, what is, what is it to be at home? What, what does it mean to be at home? Well, to be at home means to lower the threshold of alertness, right? I would say, if we say someone is homeless, we literally mean he sleeps outside. I mean, people, people do different things at home and outside of home, but one thing all people do at home, which is to sleep. I mean, for example, in New York, there is no eating at home, right? Just, you see the kitchen. <laughs> uh, but sleeping, still. So a homeless person means he sleeps outside, meaning uh, what's privileged about home literally is that you can be in total condition of not alertness, meaning sleeping. And, and the experience of being non-alert, being at home, means the capacity to read your environment. Right? You, you, are, you go in a strange place, which you don't know how to read well. You don't know what gestures means, what signs means, what nuances mean. And you're constantly on guard. You're in a hyper state of alertness, which, uh, which uh, it's very tasking, it's horrible, being a stranger in that respect. So being at home means a place where you can lower the threshold of your alertness. Just be at home. And by the way, Amiri has very powerful descriptions of this, right? He says, he describes the movement from Germany to Belgium. He said, I come to Belgium, I see this person, I don't know, is he smiling at me? Is he angry at me? Does he have good intentions, bad intentions? I cannot read any nuance here. I'm a foreigner. And, um, and then, um, and that has a major impact on your capacity to read the environment, to understand the reality you're in. This is why I would call high state of alertness of a stranger, ongoingly very taxing. That means another thing which has to do with trust. Uh, because to trust someone, I think, is to entrust someone to that. There is a relationship between trusting and entrusting. Right? So uh, uh, it means that you, you make yourself vulnerable by um, putting at the hands of someone else 
an interest, a vital interest of yours. Let's say you go to a doctor, a physician, or a lawyer, or whatever. You say, well, that's very important. I trust you with, with, that, with that very vital interest of mine. It's, a, it's, a, it's giving of trust. Well, and if you have trust in self, I mean, some people think that their own interests should not be given to themselves, right? They don't, they're not worthy of taking care of themselves. Right? So the act of trust means, um, uh, means that you have a way of reading, reading your environment, right? Um, by the way, he says something very interesting. He says, even, even if you are there for a long time, and he describes his French experience, his French experience, right? And he, he clearly mastered the language. And he, if anybody can read the nuance of French literature and other things, it's Améry. But he says, when it comes to the medical encounter with medicine, with physicians, with this, with that, I feel stranger. You know, he's a, he's a, uh, it's interesting, by the way, because these are because you you are in such a position of vulnerability that you are you can function only if you can read very carefully subtle cultural messages that are going on interpersonally that as a stranger you cannot read and you don't know am I going to this surgery is that though that by the way with trust. You need you need the high level of professionalism, clear, but you need also care. You might be very good professional; it doesn't care for you. Usually, celebrity physicians are that type. You don't go to them. I mean, I remember a friend of mine went to a lawyer. I said, "He's a very good lawyer. Do you want to win the case or be in the newspaper?" It's a very different question. So, uh, so those moments of vulnerability where you need to read the signs of of, of the world. Uh, and and you have to, you're not being at home means unable to establish relationships of trust. That has to do with your own suspicion, self suspicion, of your incapacity to read the signs, uh, cultural, interpersonal signs. Now there is another feature of Heimat that he talks a lot about, which has to do with language. He says, feeling at home in language is some way very much the same. Right? He says, uh, he, he describes in a very powerful way the, the, the way in which the linguistic horizons of him as a German shrank more and more in the places where he came to a certain degree that he felt a loss of a language. He was, he didn't have the language. And by language, we mean exactly the same thing that he meant by being at home, which is the, the capacity to read what words echo. What is their association in a language? I feel like that in English. I mean, I, I don't feel any sense of not being at home, etc. Not in that respect, but many times I, I'm not sure I, I use a term properly I, I understand I'm sure I may I'm making as I talk different blunders and uh, not not being a mother tongue so uh, so um, so he talks about that as a as a constitutive feature of his experience which that draws him to a strong attack on the very idea of possibility of a cosmopolitan identity and he speaks he speaks very dismissively of what he calls cosmopolitan tourism. Right? You can be a tourist only if you have a home. All right? uh, and by the way, I would say you can be a cosmopolitan or a diasporic Jew as an idea only if you have a passport of a strong country and better a tenure at a certain university. Right? <laughs> so uh, so um, um, uh, this idea that, that, that uh, and fascinatingly enough, he feels that his defense of Heimat, and he wants to, as he talks, he wants to distance himself from the sort of romantic kitsch 
sentimental identity talk that he knows how dangerous it could be. As he is affirming the idea of homeland, including affirming not only cultural homeland, but national sovereignty when he talk about the Czech problem and other things in this essay. There is another issue that I want to address uh, in that respect, and then I'll come to his concept of resentment. When he talks about his Jewish, the, the, this, this essay in the mind's limit, on the mind limits, uh, is the essay on the impossibility and necessity of being a Jew. And he says, well, well he says, I'm, I'm not, I didn't grow up religiously, culturally as a Jew. That's not my world, that's not my, my language. If I study it, it will be completely artificial. I'm not going to Judaize myself now. I'm not going to read Hasidic texts or Buber, etc., etc. No way. It will be false. It will be inauthentic, etc. And then he says, uh, uh, and, and I'm forced to be a Jew by, by the Nuremberg laws, by other things. Right? And at a certain moment, I'm going to, I'm going to. I'm going to read this because it's interesting. At a certain moment, he says, so maybe I should just be a human being. What's, what's the problem? He says, I'll, I'm going to be a human being. And why, why I'm so tortured about my place? And he says, well, who doesn't want to be a human being? But you're not a human. If you're not a German, or France, or French, or a Christian, or a member of a social defined community. He says the, the abstract concept of a human as defining a meaningful identity or place doesn't exist for him or altogether. Now his problem is he cannot lean back on his German. What comes to him natural, which is German identity, because that is completely blocked for him. His Jewish life is, is not authentically deep. The only thing he can do is this kind of this very interesting mode is accept his Jewishness as a, as a fate and shove it at the face of everyone. He's not going to be a closet Jew, etc., etc. And he will, which he, he understands that lacks depth and lacks robust sense of being at home. But that's the only home that he can find in his search for home. Um, so, so we have this. What, what's happening is the following, in terms of my own understanding of tension as we see. You have a very, very powerful moral and political ca category of the human. But the weight, the moral and political weight that is ascribed to that category is not carried by our actual experience at home within a very particular nuanced life as an issue. I want to speak another... Uh, now, I think, I think that a lot of his conceptions of exile, home, he was so troubled by that. And I think besides his very powerful essay on Auschwitz and torture, I mean, these are very, very powerful essays on the other side of what is it to be in exile. And there is a level of existential exile that has to do with resentment, which heightens the problem we're talking about. What is resentment? And it has to do also with this concept of mourning. What is resentment? What's the sort of his resentment? The sort of his resentment is the following. It's not about actually being tortured, being harmed, Etc. It's about the fact that that experience doesn't have any echo around. The gap between the gap between 
the personal trauma and pain and the world out there is so hard to bear that you begin to resent the world and it's a heightened condition of isolation where you are alone in your pain it doesn't have any any echo it's actually by the way in a very minor fashion is the condition of mourning that people experience personally right you the world goes on as if nothing happened and uh, and yet and doesn't reflect any of your own experience as a mourner and this is why in jewish law there is an interesting analogy between the mourner and the excommunicated there is a, um, um, an isolation from the world. Now, uh, since there was no moment of, as he read, and he, you have discussed that very beautifully, in, both in the dialogue and, and your talk, he has never experienced an actual acknowledgement of the how, serious reckoning with that. He never experienced that. And he thought that the, the, the other side of reckoning and comes resentment is that in, in some ways endorsing empathetic relation to revenge has to do with the fact that the only way, revenge is an empathy mechanism, empathy creating mechanism. I, when I'm going to bring you to my situation, we're going to share a world of pain which will relieve me of my isolation. So, uh, so here is uh, what I would call an existential category of exile, where you are absolutely isolated, where your inner mode of pain that is open and keep on being felt doesn't have any echo in the world. It says, so the, the reason, an analogy will be the Armenian the Armenian experience with the Turkish denial. It's kind of a, you can see a resentment that comes, comes out of it because what you're making of us, isolation, basically uh, isolation can lead to madness as if you cannot read reality. The, the gap between your own experience and the world out there is so strong that you don't trust anymore either reality, your reading of reality, and that's a form of hyper radical existential exile. Now, so what do we have? We have, uh, we have an attempt, a very powerful attempt on his part to, um, to defend a very precious achievement of the Enlightenment, which is the category of the human. And he has, what makes him, I think, as an Enlightenment thinker, very deep, that he understands, first of all, how fragile that category is, given all the counter-Enlightenment movements that he is experiencing, and also given his own account of Heimat and resentment. Uh, now, what is exactly the solution to that? Can, uh, can, uh, can, I mean, one way to go about it, just by way of finishing my own presentation, uh, will be the following. You would say, one definition of barbarism, you say, what, what is barbarism? Barbarism is a world that doesn't have the category of the human. Uh, 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 societies that all their moral vocabulary, all the moral furniture is associational. You know that they're barbaric. Now, uh, um, so one way to overcome the tension, yes, a certain internal tension, is to say it will be better if this is our idea of, of how embedded we are in a language, in a place at home, it will be better if those categories of the human will be derived and supported by that particular language that you have. If I want to give a, I'm going to give an example, actually a contemporary example from a German experience, which was very impressive for the world out there. Why? So when Merkel 
took, I think, the most noble position vis-a-vis -vis refugees at a certain moment, till attack from the right, etc., etc., and then there was realignment of... Uh, and he would say what drove her and what drove some public support for that, it wasn't abstract conception of enlightenment. It was a particular view of German history and the commitments that come out of the German historical experience of the 20th century. So um, is, there, is this a way of, 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 I would say, bridging the weight of the uh, bridging the, the way to carry the weight ascribed to the category of the human, the political and moral weight ascribed to the category of the human, with our deep, with, with his sense at least, how abstract and existentially unreal is that category in our actual lives? That's just a thought. Okay, I'll, I'm going to end here, and I, I think it, it follows Susan's, um, uh, Susan's presentation in, in, in a focus on a particular aspect of the Enlightenment theory, which I think is both dear and precious to him, and the, what I call the fragility of that category, both externally and internally to Ahmed. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Just see that there are quite a few. <laughs> I write down everyone on my list. <laughs> I'll start with Susan. Uh, thank you, Moshe. That was really interesting and helpful in all kinds of ways. Um, I have um, two sort of questions, uh, possibly objections. So. Um, without wanting to get into a whole long discussion of what actually was moving Merkel. Um, okay. Um, so I'm going to leave that aside. What is absolutely true, however, is that thousands and thousands of Germans were moved um, by, you're right to say, by thoughts about German history. Um, and it, was, it went beyond just hang you know, hanging up welcome signs in train stations, which did happen. People for quite a long time were taking strangers into their homes and teaching them and helping them also. So it, that was genuine. Um, it certainly had reference to, uh, you know, thoughts about German history, but I would argue that the concept of the human is so deep in us, um, you know, since the Enlightenment, that we take it for granted. And I agree with you that it's a vulnerable category. I think that's a really important thing to say. But it's also something that we just so take for granted as in, yes, of course, people of other, uh, you know, countries, genders, faith, are also human beings, which is not entirely clear before the Enlightenment. I mean, you may have it in some places. So, so I mean, I, I think we're presupposing it more deeply than we think. And then that leads to a question about your remarks about the human as an achievement, which I entirely agree it was an achievement of the Enlightenment. How do you think Amory deals with, on the one hand, um, Foucault's... Um, you know, idea that the human being is over. I mean, you, what, it seems to me that one, one could say, building on what you said is, yeah, it is a constructed idea. And the construction of that idea was an achievement and one we need to protect. Um, I don't know, I right. hope that was a clear question. Sure, sure. So thanks. So I, I, I would say, first, it is, it is so deep in us, right? We take it for granted, and it's amazing how quick it is to, how quick it is to, to collapse, especially under conditions of pressure, uh, under conditions of heightened fear, in war. You know, you've seen it in so many different ways, the us and them. Uh, and uh, many times, 
under condition what I would call um, thin identity that needs another to affirm itself, so called the enemy from within. It's so I, I I'm I'm agreement on how deep it is, and we are in agreement on how fragile it is. And I think one contribution of Amélie from reading him is he, his, his understanding of that condition. Now, I think as far as Foucault goes, I think that it's not clear what, what sort of an argument against something, against uh, again, some have say that it's constructed. So what? I mean, also a water reservoir is constructed. I mean, it's not clear what what the moral. F the only valid things are what the part of the very furniture of the cosmos. It's not. It's, I never understood the force of uncovering here, but I think Foucault wants to do something else, which is. Uh, to say that the human sciences, the growth of the human sciences, demography, criminology, psychology, sociology, etc., 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 are just very insidious ways of discipline. So there is a whole, there, first you construct the, more, the human subject, then there is a whole human science around you, which allows you to shift from punishment to discipline. Now you can discipline for all this knowledge, right? For example, now that you have a lot of pharmacological knowledge, you can control the class by distributing, uh, how is it called, those pills? I forgot the name. Not antidepressants, against... Um, ADHD. Yeah, ADHD, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there is a whole science around. So that's the way Foucault at least imagined. And he thought, and that's, what, that's why Amiri think of him as a dangerous, it's interesting, he says, he's not only ambiguous, ambivalent, it's a, he's a dangerous figure, right? Because Foucault thought that destroying the idea of the human is somehow liberating. Right? And, and from a, from a pro-enlightenment figure such as Amiri, and from his own mature understanding of history, there is something childish almost in this game that he understands. He understands the impact of destroying such a category because he has experienced it. What, do you, what is your experience in a political world that completely obliterated the category of the human? Right? And that's why for him this is no game, right? <clears throat> yes. Peter is next. I Um, just a short uh, question, and it, uh, it goes along the line of being at home where you sleep. Right. I'm very curious how Amari would have reacted had he heard this, and I'm now asking you how you are reacting to Imri Kertesz, who during a conference said to a journalist, Paul Yandel, and I'm not sure whether he ever wrote this or only said it to this journalist, right. You know, I actually felt at home in Auschwitz. Um, it's, for me, so unbearably absurd, but then behind this absurdity, because I've very often thought about Heimat and where you belong and where you feel at home, I did understand it to a certain degree, but I'm very curious how you react. I don't know, it's such a, it's such a troubling, uh, complex sentence, it's so hard to make sense. Maybe to say, maybe, it's a, it's a world that was completely predictable and understandable. Not understandable, but predictable. And by the way, there is some, some survivor's experiences that I know first-hand, second-hand, of being at loss outside, of being confused. Like someone who leaves prison after they Exactly. I think maybe he meant that. He meant something 
highly predictable and cruelly regimented. That, 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 that's a, that's a, a very convoluted, complex idea of home. Right? Uh, but I think it maybe evokes that, and I know, I've encountered it in, in different personal acquaintances, that that's experience that some survivors describe. Of, of, of not knowing, being, being at loss. Maybe that's possible. Now, James Wood, please. In some ways, my question is actually just a, a, an addendum to Peter's, but it's about, um, it's about the very interesting connection between exile and resentment that you were talking about. I'm not sure that this is an answerable question, really, but I wonder to what extent Primo Levi's ability to forgive, and we remember the right. quarrelsome relations between these two writers and the way Emery called him the forgiver, had something to do with being able to return to Milan, I right. believe, to the very same apartment that he was right. born in. Right. Well, I think it's such a gap. I think it's such a gap between Primo Levi didn't feel he was betrayed by his own culture, by his own world, by his own language. I mean, as an Italian, an Italian Jew, this is a completely different experience. So he came back. And to feel at home, he, need, he didn't need this experience being echoed in Germany. He didn't care much, or he didn't, I, I would say in that respect, he didn't care much about how to read the German response, right? He had a home, and that's a big difference between them. They, you know, linguistically, culturally. Uh, Amery was, in, in that respect, in a very unique experience. Also, as a German Jew, he was, he, he was fully German. I mean, he was, he was the most pure Austrian, sorry. Uh, he was the purest product of Bildung, I mean, of German Austrian culture. Well, so, as you say, he didn't lose a home, you realized he never had one. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. it was a retroactive yeah. death. Yeah. Stephen Holmes is next. Yeah, thanks. So I want to probe the, your defense, excuse me, your defense of uh, the human and your objection to the abstract human being. So you start with this wonderfully profound idea, I think, of Amaris, that the difference between writing in your native tongue and writing in a foreign language is not that you know the language better, but you know your audience better, which is kind of, which is, I think that's a very deep thought about, for, particularly for people who write in other languages. But you then move to this idea that you never see a human being, you only see a Frenchman or a German, which, as you probably know, that's a direct quote from De Mestre. Basically, that they're, and it's a part of the counter enlightenment. This idea. So, I want, one way of thinking. Remember, Susan said it's uh, one of the core principles of the enlightenment is to distinguish between tribalism and universalism. But there's actually another antinomy of tribalism, which is individualism, and treating other people as if they're individuals, and locating all value not in the distinction between being a member or a non-member, being a Jew or not a Jew, but being an individual. That's where all value is. So, how do, uh, I mean, I think this is uh, uh, just another right. question ab about uh, criticizing uh, universalism too facilely. And then, just as a, I know you hate the word methodology, but why do you use the word the human as a non-empirical category? Because you know human beings are a lot of bad things about human beings. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like saying the dental are only healthy teeth. Mm -hmm. So the human are only... Okay. Uh, so why do you choose okay. uh, to moralize a, what should be a descriptive category? Well, because the whole point, I think, of the Enlightenment achievement is to add a normative weight to the category of the human. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not an empirical description, you say quite human, you are now quite human, not quite anything else. You're a carrier of rights and dignity and other things, etc., etc. Not as a Frenchman or German. Absolutely, absolutely. That's the whole point. That's the ultimate achievement of that world, politically, that we try to defend. 
that we try to, I, I think we're so horrified when we see different ways in which this, category, this normative category is undermined. I, I, I think in that respect there is, we are all, I don't know, we, at least I, I'm sure you, others, um, have deep sympathy with Amiri's concern of saving and protecting that category that is both not empirical in that respect and also extremely fragile and hard to maintain. So in that, that's why I, that's why I use it as a, because empirically, uh, uh, when we talk about dehumanization, right, uh, that, that's a normative category in, in the way that humanism is a normative category. So that's why I'm using it this way. Mario Kessler. Yeah. Just, just uh, wait for the mic, please. Just, uh, just a brief addendum uh, to, to this very uh, multi complex uh, presentation, thank you very much. Uh, not many people in this room uh, may have been educated in the DDR in, in, in Old East Germany, but I was. And, in, and at the University of Leipzig, the historian Walter Marakow, the uh, teacher of two generations, including myself, uh, mentioned, uh, mentioned Ameri's essay, Philosoph Philosophia Perennis, exactly in the context that you, des that, that, that you described. When he, when, 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 when he lectured about the Gegenaufklärung, about, uh, about uh, the, his, the his historiographical trends in order to deconstruct the French Revolution, we are about 1979, 19, 19, 1980. And uh, he mentioned Amery in a way that, that, that he said he is an intellectual without a home, a heimatloser intellectueller, and Markov said, and he is not because he belongs to us. That means to a socialist discourse beyond, beyond uh, let's say, the boundaries of, of, uh, of uh, Stalinism, and, and it had, had also a double meaning. Uh, uh, Ameri was, uh, Ameri survived Auschwitz, he was tortured. Walter Markov spent not less than 11 years in jail under the Nazis. And we, he said, he belongs to us. That, that, that had a double meaning, which nobody of us could forget. Thank you. Thank you. That's a powerful, that's a very powerful remark. I see no more questions and would like you to join me in thanking Moshe Oh, we're, sorry, I forgot. We're reconvening here in this room at three o'clock.
Um, as usual, I'm not going to give a long introduction to David. You can find out various things about him in the program that you should have with you. If you don't, you can pick one up downstairs. Maybe we should try and get some upstairs. Um, <clears throat> but I do want to say that, um, so I asked everyone in inviting to this conference not to talk about Auschwitz and torture, but to talk about the parts of Amory's work that are much less discussed. But as you saw in the first two talks, it's actually not easy to talk about Amri um, at all without some reference to Auschwitz and torture because that is the background uh, to all the rest of his work. And I gave my friend and the longtime chair of the Board of Advisors of the Einstein Forum, David Schulman, a pass at the ban on <laughs> talking about torture because he's David. <laughs> Thank you, Susan, for the pass. Um, the price of it is that my talk has a somewhat grim character to it, although I promise that I will not subject you to um, graphic descriptions of physical torture. You don't need to hear that from me, those of you who would be interested in such things with reference to Palestine, you can easily find plenty of material on the website of the Israeli Committee Against Torture. Um, so, but I do want to talk about a somewhat different kind of torture than in the Amiri essay. I have a Palestinian friend whom I will call O, for obvious reasons. Um, he didn't want his name to be revealed publicly. He was tortured by the Israeli security forces in the time-honored fashion documented by Jean Amiri. Uh, I should tell you that he was arrested, picked up along with 50 other Palestinians who were simply working at some building site. There was no real reason for the arrest or for the torture, but um, that in itself is not very unusual. In any case, when he was released, he read Amiri's essay. And he said, when I read it, I felt a little less lonely. And then he thought a moment and he said to me, I felt like I was being hugged or embraced by him, by that text. I want to cry, but I can't. But I had tears. Oh, he's an unusually reflective and articulate person, and it makes sense to me that he felt a kinship with Amiri and with his, Amiri's description of the ultimate loneliness of the tortured. In O's words, regardless of how many people outside might be praying for you, there is the feeling that you are absolutely unable to resist except by maintaining yourself together somehow. He, by the way, O, oh, wants to translate the Amiri essay into Arabic. I think it's a good idea. O's experience in the torture chambers was in no way unusual. Something like a third of all Palestinian males in the occupied territories, so that means we're talking about at least several hundred thousand men, have been arrested by Israel. A vast number have spent time in prison. And at least in the early decades of the occupation, torture was, it seems, routine. Uh, before the landmark decision in 1999 of the Israel High, Israeli High Court of Justice banning torture in most cases. That judgment itself was one of the few real achievements of the Israeli left. Uh, in most cases, the loophole the judges left relates to what is called a ticking bomb. In other words, if there's reason to think that somebody might have information about a terrorist act that is about to take place, then with the written permission of the, uh, the, the uh, superior officer, 
uh, torture uh, is still allowed. Um, I want to say just one more thing about this law. You should notice that the law, that is the ruling of the High Court of Justice, is couched in instrumental terms. If you can save lives by torture, then it's legal and maybe even ethical. Still, let me say at the outset that torture in general, and in Palestine in particular, is not, in my opinion, entirely or even primarily instrumental. That is a way of extracting useful information. I think that instrumentality is an excuse or a rationalization. Anyway, while it is likely that in Israel physical torture has diminished to some extent in the last 20 years, that doesn't mean that it is no longer applied to many who have been detained. There are lots of well-documented cases. You can read about them on the website I mentioned. And recently, recently there have been reliable reports in Haaretz of renewed routine torture of Palestinian detainees, including minors, in Israeli prisons. As my friend Michal Peleg says in a recent article in Haaretz, every Palestinian knows what happens in room four of the Moscobia. The Moscobia, Migrash Husim in Hebrew, the Russian compound, that's the police headquarters in Jerusalem. Room four is where prisoners are tortured. Um, let me quote O again. He says, and I believe him, he says, the psychological torture is the most extreme beyond the physical. So that's what I'm going to be talking about, the torture of the mind. I'll begin with a very simple but non-trivial example. I'm in the Jordan Valley with fellow activists climbing a hill to confront soldiers or settlers who are harassing these Palestinian shepherds. Suddenly a group of four young settlers swoop down on us. They want to talk. They say they want to understand where clearly crazed people like us are coming from. So we talk. Neither side spares the other. And Toward the end of the conversation, which lasted maybe 20 minutes or so, one of the settlers, who was slightly older than the others, says, says to us, you're right. What we are doing to these people is cruel. In fact, inhuman. But if you look in the Bible, you will see that it, that it all follows logically and necessarily from God's promise to give the whole of this land to the Jews. End of quote. Actually, I thought the first part of this admission was a kind of achievement. Somewhere in the settler's mind or heart, he could feel the cruelty he was himself inflicting. But then the deeper truth came out. The truth is, he said, I'm quoting him again, the truth is that we don't want these people to be here, not on this hill, not anywhere in the Jordan Valley. In fact, really, we just want them not to be. I've heard a version of this statement from many Palestinians. For example, my friend, the poet uh, Azam from the village of Susia in the South Hebron Hills, he said to me recently, they won't let us build anything. Mamnu, it's forbidden. No electricity, they won't even let us drink water, they don't want us to breathe the air, they are constantly after us, the pressure never lets up. That's the end of that quote. It's a simple, factual statement. It's not unusual in itself. But sometimes, if one knows these people well, especially if you can speak to them uh, in their own language, um, you can hear the whole progression, which goes something like this. A, they don't want us to be here. B, they don't want us to be, period. C, worst of all, they don't want me to be me. And here is O once more. He says, they, that means the interrogators and the torturers, they want to deprive you of your life, not your physical life, but your essence. You are not here, this is the police officer who was interrogating him, said to him, you are not here because you did something. You are here because you exist. So I want to take a moment to consider these words. Here's the psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott. 
He says, worse than having your heart torn out of your chest by a thousand rampaging horses is the attempt by another person to violate one's own hidden self, end of quote. So I've fortunately never been physically tortured, but like many of us, maybe all of us, I know something about that sort of psychic violation. And I think all Palestinians in the territories know about it. It's the meaning of what is perhaps the most common word in the Arabic language, zulum. Zulum means something like injustice or oppression, zulum. As in the phrase, aishin fi haya kulliyata zulum ab zulum. We are living a life of oppression within oppression. Of course, it's not only the occupation that produces such sentences, though it's a fertile ground for them. Deep in the fiber of the language is a notion of malicious hurt, often linked to other words such as pride or honor, sharaf, or what is right, haq. Zulam happens all the time. It is almost as if one were waiting for it with an exquisite sensitivity to potential pain that radiates outward from the violated core of the person. At the heart of Zulam is an unfairness that no human creature can understand or withstand. It's crucial to recognize that in situations like in Israel, where zulum in the sense of psychic or spiritual violation of an entire people is the norm, passivity and silence on the part of the community that is perpetrating torture is itself a kind of violation possibly worse, more consequential than what, happen, than what happens in the torture chambers of the Moscovia. By the way, Azam, the poet I quoted earlier, uh, he was arrested at the age of 13. Again, it was one of these random things. He was on a bus, he was working in agriculture in Israel, inside the Green Line, and uh, at some roadblock, uh, the soldiers came in and they just took him out of the bus and then they arrested him, they held him for some months and he was tortured. I asked him about it. He said, don't ask me, I saw what I saw. He was only 13 years old. Anyway, uh, he did say he was, um, among other things, he was hung by one arm from a hook or a chain in the ceiling for an entire night and so on. I'm not going to go into that. Surprisingly, despite all this and more, Azam is not embittered. He has the poet's tragic joyfulness in life, he wants to publish a diwan of his poems. Identicide, the conscious or unconscious attempt to efface the inner core of the other or others, may be a crime against the individual as well as a crime against the collective body. The individual is turned into a disposable object, lacking life, time, thought, hope, personhood. But in Palestine, we find the collective variety of identicide, which is readily broken down to individual suffering. That is, the effacement of one's own mind and all the cultural and linguistic pieces of that mind that allow us to be ourselves. We cannot think or feel at all without a language and a language-specific cultural world that gives us orientation in space, time, or memory. O says, when you have been tortured, tomorrow does not exist. I want to try to describe the modes of psychic torture that one encounters every day in the occupied territories. I was first exposed to one extremely prevalent variety in 1988-89 during the first Intifada when I used to work uh, one day a week at the Moked, that is the Center for the Defense of the Individual, a Moked Laganata Prat. Um, that's an organization which was founded then during the first Intifada by Lotze Salzberger and Yossi Schwartz, and it was something new in the Israeli public space. Uh, for me, it was a formative experience. In those days, before there were cell phones as we know them, the archetypal experience I encountered had to do with Palestinian mothers whose sons or sometimes husbands or brothers had been arrested by the army and then disappeared into the Israeli prisons. Disappeared because in nearly all cases, the family had no information whatsoever about where their loved one was 
or even if he was still alive. Um, in parentheses, I would like to add in my own subjective view, the great majority of those arrests was arbitrary and without significant relation to the protests that were going on through Palestine. Recently, a senior officer in the Israeli intelligence agencies admitted publicly, he said, we have arrested thousands upon thousands, often without any reason, and almost always without any useful result. Anyway, the mother would sit in front of me. She was dressed in black. She was usually crying in extreme distress. And we would begin to call the prisons one after another until we finally, after some hours on the phone, would find the young man or boy. I don't recall a single case when we failed to find him. And that was at least some comfort. But the suffering I witnessed and felt in myself was immense. I don't know how to describe it. I think you feel it like a kind of craziness, a flooding of fear and anger and despair. Today, too, one can hear Palestinian mothers saying, the worst thing for me is that I cannot protect my children. They know that arbitrary arrest, usually in the middle of the night when soldiers invade the home, is an ever-present possibility to say nothing of the danger of arbitrary killings in the villages. Hundreds of Palestinian miners are held now, as I speak, in Israeli prisons. And the police statistics show that 30 to 50 new arrests of this kind take place every week. And many miners, like hundreds of adult Palestinian prisoners, are held in what is called administrative detention, ma'atsar min hali, that is, arrest without trial, uh, supposedly preemptive in nature, without the arrested even knowing what he or she is charged with for what is, in effect, an unlimited period of time. Technically, if you're arrested like that in this administrative detention, you can be held at the discretion of the army commander who signs the order uh, for six months, but the uh, commander has the right to extend that order uh, indefinitely. And the tortuous element lies in the prisoner's utter helplessness before the law or the caprice of the state, and above all, in his not knowing how long he will have to endure this suffering. I often wonder about the children, like Azam, who find themselves in this situation of extreme terror, sometimes for years. What are we to make of Jehan Abu Romi, the mother of an 18-year-old detainee? Her son was terrified after interrogators told him that his mother had died in a car crash and that he had to sign a confession if he wanted to intend, attend her funeral. This is according to a report by the Adala Justice Project. The car crash, of course, was a lie. And that kind of blackmail is, I believe, habitual. And here is O again. O said that they told him, you will never see your mother or your brothers and sisters alive again. So that's one kind of psychic torture. I want to say another word about what happens to the minors, to the children, um, for whom any confidence in the continued existence of their world, their home, their own sense of being is destroyed. That erosion of minimal trust doesn't even require arrest and physical torture. Just a month ago in the Jordan Valley, there was a case where Israeli settlers attacked one of the women shepherds who was out in the grazing fields with her flocks and with her young son, whom I happen to know. The shepherdess was brutally beaten by the settlers and thrown to the ground. Her son, maybe seven years old or so, was also wounded in his hand. But the truly terrible part for him, which he was able to express, was witnessing his mother humiliated and hurt by these violent settlers. He was crying uncontrollably when our activists reached them. I suppose I don't really need to say any more about this event. It too is not at all unusual. Palestinian children grow up seeing their parents' impotence in the face of the organized crime of the occupation. By the way, the army, which in theory should be charged with preventing that kind of settler attack, almost invariably teams up with and backs up the violent settlers. 
Um, by the way, it's not only Palestinians who suffer like this. Uh, Israeli peace activists are in similar danger. Um, if I had time, I would be tempted to tell you something of the experience of a close friend of mine, Guy Bultavia, who was arrested on a trumped-up car uh, charge and uh, held for three weeks. And uh, he left a document, an amazing uh, document, uh, documenting the psychological torture that was inflicted upon him. I'm not going to say more about it, but Palestinians, Israeli leftists, and peace activists, it's all part of the same picture. And I have still said nothing about the demolition of houses, the expulsions, the constant threats, the ongoing state terror, the murder of innocents in the villages, the nocturnal invasions of homes, the humiliation at the roadblocks, and many other features of the occupation system. I believe, echoing something that Ameri said, I believe that psychic torture of the Palestinian civilian population is the core and indeed the raison d'etre of the occupation. We may need to distinguish between bearable and unbearable torture. Believe it or not, the sordid list I have just given you is in the category of bearable torture. People manage with great pain to live with it. Psychic torture aimed at the eradication of the self, whether it is the individual self or the collective cultural self with its centuries of history, its accumulation of shared experience, that kind of torture, psychic torture, belongs to the unbearable category. I think it is that kind of unbearable torture that is the root cause of terrorism. Identicide is a form of revenge. It's not limited to Israelis, obviously. But the Israeli occupation offers a particularly trenchant example. The message that may come from a soldier or a policeman or an official of the civil administration or a military judge is, you don't exist. We are going to wipe out all trace of your existence here or anywhere, and we will make you go away. Mass identicide demands a system, or we might call it a mass systemic psychosis. Um, in Ranana Alexandrovich's film, it's a really important film, The Law in These Parts, I recommend it, The Law in These Parts, senior judges in the Israeli military courts in the territories speak of their work two decades ago or more. So you have to know that the military courts have a conviction rate for Palestinians of over 99%. And that includes Palestinians who have just been randomly arrested. I think that's the majority of the cases. So no Palestinian has a chance of finding justice there. The judges invariably toe the line and follow the recommendations of the Shabak, that is the security goons, who give the judges evidence, if you can call it that, that the accused has no access to. Yet at least some of these judges appear in Ranan's film to be honest men. This is important. One of them describes how he would stay up all night before the trials, agonizing over what to do with the evidence he has been given. But one can't help but ask, why did he bother? The result was axiomatic and inevitable. If this is what constitutes conscience, who needs it? Couldn't this judge have resigned from his role in torturing the victims? Maybe he couldn't. The system overrides any such act, except in the cases of very exceptional individuals. I don't know of any judges in those courts who have taken that step. And there is never any dearth of new judges who will do as they are told. So here's the point, the essence of the matter. The occupation as a whole rests upon psychic torture of the occupied. It never stops. And one result of it is, as Amiri has said, the terrifying loneliness of the victim of torture, including psychic torture. A state of isolation almost inconceivable, yet somehow familiar to all of us. It is in facing that loneliness and overcoming it enough to act and to think to act and to think that the human virtues of courage 
and hope reside. These are hard-won virtues, rarest of all. Amiri embodied them. Incidentally, the loneliness doesn't go away when you are released from prison. You return home to an alien existence. You cannot speak of what you have suffered, even to your family. You go to work, you exhaust yourself so you don't have to think about it. You're always tired, but you do not express sadness except through dark humor. Still, at some point, what has been buried will manifest itself, and then they will come back to get you, to torture you some more. There's another man, he's a friend of my friend O. We'll call him R, who lived in one of the camps, the refugee camps, and he had an idea, a good idea. He wanted to start a library. So the soldiers came to him and they said, O, oh, came to him and said, O, oh, so you want them to read, do you? And then they killed him. We, the activists in the field, cannot do away with Palestinian loneliness. Perhaps we can slightly, tenuously ameliorate it, as Amélie's essay did for O. Not much more than that. In a strange form of osmosis, we often discover something of that unthinkable aloneness in ourselves. I think it is possible to recognize and to understand this kind of spontaneous empathy that it takes the form of knowing the interior of another person's mind, or even of the minds of an entire people, number, numbering millions. Sometimes I wonder if the torturers become who and what they are because they are unable to bear that spontaneous, partly unconscious empathy with their victims. It eats away at them, and meanwhile, they begin to enjoy their job. I'm almost finished. I have one last thought. Um, it'll take me a minute or two to articulate it. You've got plenty of time. Don't okay, worry. all right. No, no, we, we have a long coffee break afterwards. So okay, we we'll probably need it. Uh, <laughs> So here, the last thought. We, the activists still on our feet, are cut off from nearly all other Israelis, as if we are lepers or traitors, and we cannot ever become Palestinian. I, for one, don't want to become Palestinian. Well, I have to say, occasionally I'm tempted, you can imagine. But I don't really want to become Palestinian. I'm a Jew, and I want to be a Jew. The kind of Jew my grandparents were, not the brainwashed Jews of the nation state, who in their own distorted way may also suffer a kind of self-inflicted identicide. It may sound laughable today, but all my grandparents were Rooseveltian Democrats, like all Ashkenazi Jews in America of the 1930s. And they were also heirs to the Jewish humanistic tradition, which still survives in pockets, also in Israel. I think this old and venerable Jewish tradition is fiercely antithetical to, indeed incapable of, inflicting identicide on others. So, strangely, starting with systemic psychic torture and the ongoing attempt by Israeli Jews to destroy forever not only Palestinian homes and grazing grounds and fields and bodies, but also Palestinian consciousness and selfhood. Faced with that, starting with that, I find myself back at the age-old question, who is a Jew or what is a Jew? And you know what? I'm beginning to think it's not a very good question. Um, and anyway, I don't know the answer to it. Um, but I think I can perhaps tell you what a Jew is not, in my own understanding. So we have the testimony of a Tibetan monk. It's possible I learned this from Amber, I'm not sure. There was a Tibetan monk who spent years in Chinese prisons and who was repeatedly and perhaps more or less constantly tortured there. Um, and when he got out, he said, it got to be so bad that I was almost, almost unable 
to feel compassion for my torturers. So I stand in awe at that, sentence, at that sentence and at that feeling, but I don't think it fits the Jewish template. I don't think so. The Jews know a lot about unforgivable crimes and also about acts of torture, mental and physical, but not, it seems, for most of them, about the ones they are inflicting in Israel-Palestine on their Palestinian brothers and sisters. Sometimes I think that for the Jews, some hope for a better life lies in that cultural refusal to forgive the unforgivable. And I like to think that a day will come when Israelis, many of them, will recognize what we have done and maybe even seek forgiveness. That thought is the first faint glimmer of hope. And now we may wonder, what would Jean Amiri have said about the Tibetan monk's amazing statement? Thank you. David, thank you for uh, a talk that was um, both harrowing, but also moving. And um, although I follow some of what you've been doing in the territories, um, there were things that I didn't know about either. Um, I want to depart for a second from our usual procedure. Our usual procedure is not to give introductions to people um, because we don't want to take the time and we have it all printed up for you. Um, and when I said I gave David a pass because, David, because he's David, uh, several people who know him in the room smiled um, and understand that what I meant by that, I, since our very controversial conference, not quite three weeks ago, um, we have gotten some rather unpleasant coverage of various kinds, particularly on Twitter. And we got something from uh, one of our opponents saying, look, these horrible anti-Israel people are using jean Marie now to um, uh, you know, instrumentalizing Jean, Jean Marie. So if you're watching or listening, you know who you are. I do want to introduce David Schulman. Um, just for a moment, we also got criticized by some people at that conference, what is an activist doing at an academic conference? In fact, the particular activist in question had a PhD um, and had published a serious book. But I do want to say to anybody with doubts, um, the Einstein Forum never does standard academic conferences. We always mix scholars, writers, artists, political, politicians, and activists. That's what we do. With David Shulman, we basically have the prototype of the scholar activist. Although he's not known in Germany, uh, he has received the most distinguished prizes in most of the rest of the world for his scholarly work on India, including the Israel Prize, um, which is the highest prize the State of Israel can give, uh, which he hesitated about accepting, uh, and then accepted it with a public video, uh, saying he was accepting it because he could give the prize money to Tayush, the Israeli Arab organization that he has been working with since the Second Intifada. Um, so, yeah, um, that's for those of you who want to shoot little arrows <laughs> at us after. David's talk, but in fact, I think it was entirely 
uh, in keeping with some other things that we've already discussed in this conference, um, particularly thinking about Moshe's discussion of the achievement and fragility of the concept of the human. And when you quoted your um, the settlers saying that they know that this is inhumane what they're doing. Um, I see an absolutely direct connection. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about, um, you know, we talked about the fact that the concept of the human is an enlightenment achievement. There was just us and them before. There was just my tribe and the other tribes. Um, and clearly, of course, what the settlers are going on is a, you know, a biblical, pre-enlightenment, uh, tribal concept of um, these, yeah. what we've known, what we've come to call human beings. I wonder if you see any place, given that they can already recognize that they're doing something humane, to bring them to a concept of the human. Um. So first of all, I have to say something before I address the question uh, directly. Um, the settlers are a heterogeneous group, and I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't generalize about all of them by any means. The ones that I tend to meet out in the field, um, I don't know how many of them there are altogether, but perhaps there are no more than about, let us say, 30,000 or 40,000 of them. That is, these are extreme violent settlers, most of them. Um, well, many of them, especially now, in the last year or two, um, they're sort of troubled adolescents who have been somehow absorbed within the settler project very deliberately in a calculated way. They're confused and um, they tend to be very violent and they're brainwashed also, you know. But that doesn't mean that all settlers are like that. Well, you shouldn't think like that. It's, um, you know, most of them are regular people like anybody else. They're living in settlements usually initially for economic reasons, and uh, it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, I don't want to generalize about them, but these ones that I now meet in the field, and they are extraordinarily violent, I, um, I sometimes say things to them, uh, doesn't do any good. I might say to them something like, um, you know, these people are just like us. They're no different than us. They're human beings. They're just like us. They have the same, they want what we want. Same kinds of things, simple life, something like that. Uh, you have to understand that it's not exactly a conversation. This happens in a heightened uh, moment of uh, kind of distress and violence and so on, but there are potential violence. Um, it's extremely unusual for any of them to actually uh, respond to that in any way. Once I said, sometimes, uh, if you use something that touches upon their own language, their own mental world, uh, you might get a response. For example, um, uh, I once said, um, <laughs> we're out in the field, so the uh, usual thing, Palestinian village, the fields are being taken over by these settlers, they're marauding settlers that are there in the Palestinian fields every day, they're driving them crazy, they're extremely violent. So, and they attacked um, a friend of mine physically, he was beaten up, and uh, when I managed to extricate him, and I, these settlers are still there, I said to them, you know, haven't you ever heard that God said in the Bible, thou shalt not steal? So, um, Settler is taken aback for a moment, he, one of them, he, so he looks at me and he says, what do you mean? I said, you know, it's pretty simple, isn't it? I, it's pretty simple, thou shalt not steal, look what you guys are doing. Um, and for that very reason, because you're transgressing this commandment, I said, not in exactly these words, but I said, I don't think you're going to be in this place you're living in for very long. That's what I said, I was kind of optimistic view. So he said to me, correctly, he said, um, you just pick the passages that happen to be convenient to your view. <laughs> and he's right about that, actually. He's, in a way, he's kind of right, you know, it's true. 
And I could give you other examples of that, but it's extremely rare to find among those, that self-selecting group, a real response. And I think that most of them feel that Palestinians do not count as people, as human beings. I think they think that they're a different category. And the reason I feel I can say that is that um, what usually comes out of them, out of their mouths, is this, this kind of stream of uh, unbear unbearably boring and repetitive curses. Once I said to one of them, you know, I said, okay, you can uh, yell at me and curse me, but I don't know how you can stand to live with this stuff going on in your head all the time. It's terrible, absolutely horrible, you know. But they're not able to see that or feel it's just something some, somebody like me from the outside might, might notice. I mean, some of them, I suppose, are capable of thinking that uh, the main thing is just to get these people out of there, and that's the point, but... There's a lot of them that take great delight in causing pain, physical pain. I have a follow-up question, but let me ask first, is there anyone here who has a question? This here? Um, I hope I, I get it clear in, uh, in, in a short amount of time. Um, when Amari writes about that he tries, that's how I do Look at very graphically that he tries to be Jewish mm. without being it completely in his inner self, but that's the choice he sees for himself. In your um, work as an activist, both inside Israel and with Jewish communities outside Israel, um, where many, to my biggest surprise, are supportive of what is going on. At mm. least, yeah, they are supportive, I'd say. Um, for the, for the readings I did during the last years, it sometimes came to me that there is like a shortcut in argument as um, we don't want to identify as victims, we want the freedom of choice, and I, I mean it as ironically as it sounds, mm -hmm. of not being the victims, but the prosecutors. So. Sometimes I have the very depressing feel, and does, is this an argument you meet? And, and how to deal with it? I sometimes find this very depressing, but I have the feeling that a lot of the argument around the state of Israel and why we are even supposed to turn, not to look at what is happening. As you said on various occasions, even in Germany, the state tries us to keep from expressing what is going on in mm. a way that is actually, from my point of view, not completely in line with our, even our constitution. Um, do, do you hear an argument like this, like finally we have the choice whether we want to be the victims or the prosecutors, and now we want to be the prosecutors for once? Can I, before David answers this, um, it is not true that most of the Jewish communities outside Israel, okay, support the occupation. Okay, no, I'm just saying, uh, yeah, but you don't hear about it inside Germany very often, okay? But as a matter of fact, um, you know, the majority of Jewish communities outside of Israel, they, um, there's a whole variety of differences, but it, it, they do you not. Maybe in New York you go to BDS meetings. I mean, I'm aware of that. Hmm. Well, even apart from BDS, there, there are ranges of views, yes, I'm aware but of that. That's what I mean. don't include supporting the occupation. So, um, yeah, it's kind of hard to answer that question with any kind of authority. I'm, I'm just a grassroots peace activist. I really don't know. Um, I imagine that there are many Israelis who may feel, may feel unconsciously something like, what you articulated, namely, we're not going to be the victims anymore, let somebody else be the victims. They might feel like that, some people might. I have no idea of how one would even measure that or what it would be to think of it like that. And I think that, um, although um, politically speaking, the country has shifted very much to the right, uh, I still think, uh, even now, that more than half of the Israeli population uh, is basically somewhere uh, in the moderate center, somewhere. I mean, that's a 
gross simplification, but something like that. There are reasons that the country chooses right-wing governments, and sometimes extreme right-wing governments, you know. So, I mean, maybe Israelis, some Israelis feel, yeah, they don't want to be victims anymore, and they have the opportunity now to inflict pain. And they prefer that to the other, and of course there's a lot of fear of the Palestinians, justified fear. It's a complicated uh, situation, and actually I tend to think, I've said this in this very room once or twice before, I think that when one acts, in a, when one adopts an activist mode, as in the Palestinian territories, one acts not out of uh, uh, what Susan has called moral certainty, but out of uh, uncertainty, moral, moral clarity. clarity, sorry, moral clarity, but out of... Uh, I believe in certainty. Right, okay, clarity. One tends to act out of a kind of sense of uh, uh, amorphous ambiguity in which you're trying to do the best you can under very difficult and complicated uh, conditions. I think it's very important to act. One has to act because the suffering is immense and we're responsible for that part of it. But, um, yeah, I don't think I fully believe in moral clarity, actually. <laughs> Dominic. Um, I want to introduce a term that um, Amari talks about that we haven't addressed yet. I assume it'll come up at some point, but... Can you be louder? It looks yeah. like people in the back are straining. So, um, in the, the essay on resentment or resentments, you know, he has this moral imperative that there are some wounds that are irreversible, mm -hmm. right? And they... Not, it's not only that they can't be healed, but they shouldn't be seen as capable of being healed. Yeah. And they kind of exist outside of the natural time and kind of remain in this moral universe as a, as a, as a, just as a, as a psychic wound. Um, and I was wondering, um, I mean, this sets them apart from uh, Primo Levi, obviously, although I just like to add that I think when it comes to forgiveness, it doesn't really make sense to speak of forgiveness unless you have someone approach you who wants to be forgiven. Yeah. I think the idea of just forgiving someone as an act without being asked for it yeah. doesn't really make sense to me. But the question I wanted to ask is um, whether for these friends of yours um, that have been tortured, if, I mean, I guess this is more of a psychological question, if there's something about maintaining this moral imperative of a wound that can't be healed that's actually not good for your soul because there's no way then to reintegrate with society at large. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, Dominique, that, that seems right to me in the sense that um, something I know in myself. I think there are such, there are unforgivable sins. And um, I myself, I can't adopt the Buddhist ethic of absolute compassion no matter what, like the Tibetan monk. I can't do it. Um, but that doesn't mean that one has to remain uh, enslaved to the resentment that comes out of the pain that has been inflicted upon you and that is unforgivable. It doesn't mean that. This friend of mine, oh, you know, uh, he carries the burden of the torture around with him. He told me, you know, and it comes back in his dreams, night after night. But he's eminently capable of being with Israelis, you know, and of thinking of what peace might look like. I, I've i seen it, let me put it in a very concrete way. There have been quite a few occasions on which I've seen, you know, there are dialogue groups and things like that. Israelis and Palestinians might meet. Um, there are organizations that are based on creating uh, some kind of possible communication. The combatants for peace is one of them, so they routinely run these groups where Israelis who served in the army 
and Palestinians who served in one or the other of the um, Palestinian militant groups meet and discuss things. And, you know, I've seen cases where initially the uh, meetings are very difficult. Often, almost always, it's the case that um, these Israelis, former soldiers, never actually saw a Palestinian civilian as a civilian. They saw only an enemy to be you know, in the, the sights of their gun or something like that. And suddenly they're faced with actually living people. And similarly for the Palestinians, same thing. They saw Israelis only as armed soldiers who were about to kill or wound. And it can go on like that for a long time, even for days actually, in which the two sides don't know what to say to one another at all. But little by little, the nature of the pain and the hurt becomes present in the space and is articulated one way or the other. And sooner or later, there will almost always be a moment where somebody on one of the sides suddenly says, I get it, I understand it, I understand that we have hurt you, we have hurt you terribly, and I'm sorry. And then things change. It's amazing how things can change. You don't have to forgive the, you don't have to forgive the unforgivable, and that's not part of the plan, and I think it's mostly impossible for Palestinians and Israelis. I don't think it's really possible. But to be able to say, I'm sorry, that's an amazing human achievement, and I've seen it happen. You know, once there was this time, I was very moved by, a, we were in Susia, this little village, and there was a whole busload of these combatants for peace who were down there in the Palestinian village for the first time in Palestine. Most of them had never actually been in the occupied territories unless they were there in the army as soldiers, you know. So now here, there's this big busload of these combatants for peace that the first time in this Palestinian village, you know, and there were Palestinians also part of the same organization. They were on the bus, you know. And there were the beginnings of these conversations. So, you know, I, I was there with my group before these people arrived. So I see them arrive. I go up there and I, I overhear a conversation uh, which was very moving to me. Uh, there was a young Palestinian man and a young Palestinian woman. And they were in some kind of conversation. They obviously liked one another, you know. So the Palestinian man said to the woman, um, he said, um, can I invite you to come to my house? So for the Israeli girl, you know, this was like, I, this was way beyond what she would have thought possible at all, you know. She said, no, I don't think I can do that. Um, you know, to go into a Palestinian city or village and to be a guest at a Palestinian house, this is something totally beyond her range and all that. She said, I don't think I can do that. And about a minute later she said, you know what, I'll come. And I thought, you know, that's good, you know, and if those kinds of things can happen. That's what gives me hope sometimes, is the mere fact that such moments of change, internal change, can happen. Even though nobody's going to forget the pain. Yeah. Stephen, and then Peter. Kind of going back to the question of progress. Can you be an activist without believing that progress is possible? Without believing that progress is possible. In other words, yeah. is activism, this is really addressing Susan's question, yeah. can you have a bleak, completely bleak picture of what's probable and still be an activist? It's pretty bleak. If you're asking about my picture, it's pretty bleak. <laughs> I don't you know. Without really that yeah. I have this thing about despair. I wrote an essay about it. It's in one of my books. I think there's, there's good despair and bad despair. There's good despair. If you're, you know, there's a way in which if you, who is it who says, um, Sindral, the French poet Sindral says, uh, in order to know despair, you have to love life. Uh, <laughs> have to really love life and I think there is such a thing as good despair. I used to say, sometimes the activists will say it too, if we weren't feeling despair or even beyond despair, we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be here. We're there because of that despair. You know? So the answer is, yeah, you, I think of course you could. In fact, you have to do it. And I accept, um, embrace uh, Susan's distinction between optimism and hope. 
I think they're two very, very different totally things. Different. Yeah, hope is a spiritual act. And sometimes the worse things get, the more hope you feel. Um, that's an empirical fact. So, you know, that doesn't mean that there are no moments where I, I might feel, gosh, I, you know, can't go on doing this. And also it's getting more and more dangerous. And I, you know, it's, I have those thoughts as well, you know. You know, um, we've known each other long enough so that I might um, <laughs> allow myself to disagree a little bit with your <laughs> answer um, because you've both written and talked about this question often enough. Um, the last time I remember you're answering a similar question, you said, I'm doing this for my granddaughter. I don't think I will see um, yeah. an any real change in my lifetime, but I'm doing it for her. Now, I totally understand mm -hmm. why um, the situation in Israel-Palestine, uh, you know, gets worse every day and leaves more room for despair. But frankly, the whole world these days is getting worse every day, and we're all fighting despair. Um, but I, I, I liked your idea of saying you were doing this for your granddaughter, and that's, yeah. um, you know, it's not a belief in the necessity of progress, but it is the belief in the possibility of it, right? Or have you changed your... So I used to feel, Susan, I, I used to think in the early years when I became active in the territory, I used to feel that I would live to see peace. It seemed to me not so distant, actually. I mean, you know, if you look at the, what happened in the year 2000, they were within some kind of almost a stone's throw of an agreement. Um, and I think that could happen, but I don't, I no longer think that I'll live to see peace. I don't feel that. I do want my grandchildren to be proud of their grandfather if they read about me someday. I, that is certainly there. Uh, and I don't have any illusions that the little that we can do is going to make a real, real difference. I don't think so. But doing it is important. And also I know that we act not so much because of the possible results. We do it because it's the right thing to do. The intrinsic value of a moral act is in the act, not so much in the results. Not that we're indifferent to good results. We're not. <laughs> no. yeah. Peter, and then James. Um, <clears throat> I think it's uh, valid in our Jean Améry conference to mentioned the fact that in the 70s the uh, German left tried very hard to uh, have Ameri on their side against Israel hmm. and he refused. Yeah, I know. And perhaps you would like to say something about that. Of course, Israel today is not the Israel back then. Yeah. We don't know how Jean Ameri would react to today's Israel. But I find it important in our context not to leave that unmentioned. Yeah, I know that. I, I know that Amiri refused to sign on to the program of the far left or the left in general, and that he defended Israel and that he thought it was enormously important, that there was a moral imperative uh, embedded in the mere existence of the state of Israel. He felt that. But I agree with what you said. It was a different Israel. I went to live in Israel in 1967. It was a different, it was a different place. The public sphere it was not a utopian space, but the public space was not poisoned by the kind of hyper-nationalist stuff that we hear today. It wasn't like that. Yeah. And by the way, I'm not sure, maybe you know, was Amari in Israel? I don't know. I think he never was. I don't think he was. Yeah, I don't know, yeah. Two things I just wanted, not questions, just and comments that just, you know, it's terrible how one wants to spun. This is what you produce, is the desire to spontaneously uh, comment. Um, uh, I, I loved what, I was terribly moved by what you said. Um, just two things that occurred to me. One is, just off what Dominic was saying, I, I'm not actually sure, despite Emery's um, term for Primo Levi, that he did actually uh, forgive in quite the way that Emery thought he did. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the wonderfully sly and ambiguous um, essay about Muller in um, the periodic table, he comes to a conclusion that he won't actually forgive Muller and that Muller doesn't deserve it anyway. 
Um, but that's beside the point. I just wanted to say that the beautiful thing about um, doing something for your granddaughter um, took me back to Moshe's lecture about the human and made me think that that's pretty much John, Stewart's, John Stuart Mill's definition of what he calls the religion of humanity, um, leading, leaving something for future generations um, to uh, develop. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. I want to ask a final question, if I may. Um, and it was provoked by your talking about your cherry picking your biblical quotes, yeah. which of course we all do. <laughs> and um, I, um, I recently wrote to our Rebbe, um, David and I actually met because we have the same rabbi. <laughs> he was here. <laughs> yes, yes, he's also been here. Um, I wrote to him saying, you know, the contradictions between universalism and tribalism in the Bible, which, of which there are many. I mean, you know, on the one hand, it's you were strangers, take care of the stranger. On the other hand, it's remember Amalek. I mean, you know, it's, it's yeah. famished. Um, and I said, you know, does biblical criticism help us here? Um, you know, could we say that all of the tribalist uh, passages were written by J or X or Y and uh, you know the universalist passages by others and Jim wrote back and said um, Susan uh, the Jewish people have been having a civil war about this since her time in, uh, in existence and I wonder if you could comment on that um, and whether you think that's I mean we have these just two inextricably or inextricable um, strains, the one giving us a concept of the human and the other taking it back and talking about tribes. So really this is a question for Moshe, who's more immersed in the sources than I am, I guess, but um, not I guess, I'm sure. Um, See, I guess I grew up with an illusion. Uh, my mother taught us children that she said, um, being Jewish, what does it mean? She was very much into her Jewishness. That was the central part of her life. Um, so she what does it mean? She said, we were slaves. Once we were slaves in Egypt, and because of that, we will never, but truly never, enslave another person or stand on the side of the oppressor, never. So I thought, okay, that's what being Jews, being Jewish was all about. I grew up the same way in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> this is what being Jewish <laughs> Probably it's some enlightenment period illusion. I don't really know. And the one way to cure that illusion is to go to live in Israel. But on the other hand, uh, I still tend to think that not every word in the Bible is of on the same level or status as any other word. There are some core things that really, at least for me, have greater weight. And um, so on that level, it's easy for me to like cherry pick, as you said, and I pick the ones that I, that I like. It's a problem because the proof texts that are opponents have to use are also there in the text. Right. That's no, right. No question they are. About that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have a coffee break now until 4.30, but please join me in thanking David Schulman. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you back to the, the last set for today, the last two speakers for Friday on Jeanne Marie. And we'll be doing them in a, as I said, in a set, so there won't be any break between them. Um, the next speaker is a political scientist. Um, a long-standing member of the Einstein Forum Advisory Board and a shrewd analyst of the wide range of subjects from illiberalism and Putin's Russia to liberal guilt and the West response to terrorism. Uh, please join me in welcoming Stephen Holmes once again to the Einstein Forum. Well, it's great to be here. It's a little intimidating. In front of, I, I love the, uh, the lineup this afternoon, all my friends, my brilliant friends. And uh, I like doing a tag team with Yvonne. Um, OK, I see already that I've, I've got myself in trouble because I'm wearing the wrong pair of colors. <laughs> you, know, you know, George Washington really intimidated his troops by saying, I've gone blind in the service of my country. I can't quite say that, but anyway. So. Um, I'm going to be going over some of the ground uh, that Susan covered this morning, but with less knowledge. So that's a, a little bit of a problem. And scrambling to prepare, I guess swatting, is that the word? I was scrambling to prepare for this uh, conference. I knew not, virtually nothing about it, Marie, except at the mind's limits. And even a few weeks ago, when uh, Susan asked me for a title in order to make the deadline of the brochure, I didn't really have a clear idea of what I was going to say, especially to an audience like this. So my first idea, um, even though it's uh, paradoxical, it's still not true. See, it comes from a kind of swift reading of the philosophical essays, and particularly once you talked about the, uh, the uh, waggish remarks about Adorno and Foucault and so on. Um, and uh, I was very struck, like Susan was, particularly by this idea of the fear of banality. And of course, why is it so striking? Because it's not a banal idea at all. It's just like the most, like the most un, you know, if you're like me, I teach in a law school, I have to read long law school articles. They are so banal. And fearing, I mean, avoiding banality seems should be a high principle of intellectual life. But of course, so it is a counterintuitive idea of his. And it does have, of course, a very strong uh, point, uh, even though counterintuitive thinking can be opening doors. It can also be something superficial and just a, 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 a denial of common sense, which often is what he's talking about. Um, let's see if we can. All right, uh, this addiction to paradox. And um, although I came away really, really, the more I read, the more I admire Amory and kind of in awe of him, uh, I would rather uh, have titled this talk, guess what, enlightenment and despair. Now, I don't know if it's good despair, but, but in, there is a connection, and the two Amoris really can't understand them separately, obviously. Um, and it's kind of in line with what David asked earlier about suicide and so on. I'm not, um, okay, I'm not I'm, I don't want to be fair here to Foucault and to Adorno and so on, but I did have a lot of fun reading uh, Amoris' uh, uh, polemics, uh, very polemical, uh, strong polemics against them. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of ink and I've written a lot about anti-enlightenment traditions, starting with Demestra, and they're all, they're all, uh, there's a kind of permanent structure of counter-enlightenment thought in different settings. It's amazing how similar it is over the decades and even over two centuries. Um, often, one of the ideas is that science is both Promethean and hubristic, and on the other hand, it gives you no moral guidance. So if there's something really vacuous about it, um, a science of scientific a science is a very disturbing kind of authority because it invites criticism. What kind of authority is that? So there's a kind of there's a worry about or there's an antagonism to the scientific mind. And if you look at the origins, the first the 19th century version of the dialectic of enlightenment. It was that reason is self-defeating because it is a war against religion. And religion is the basis of civilized life. It's a rebellion against God. Secularization is the crisis of the West. 
Um, the philosophers who destroyed religion were sawing off the branch they were sitting on. And, uh, and how, after all, how will people behave if they don't think they're being watched by a punitive power? What if you actually um, uh, made it, put in the school curriculum the philosophy of Jacques Monod, as, as Amory describes it, you know, we are insignificant flecks of organic matter flung arbitrarily through empty space and so on. That's not very, uh, I don't know, it doesn't really uplift you. So it makes you ask, um, particularly if enlightenment uh, means that, as Amory says, man is alone in an unfeeling immensity of the universe in which he has emerged by chance. Uh, and that's a challenge. I, I think that's what the most the early counter-enlightenment theorists were very afraid of. They said, you can't say that. If you do say that, uh, only very few people, this Leo Strauss, you know, only a few people can actually respond to this and live a life of dignity. So it's a kind of, uh, the idea that you can make this a public philosophy is, uh, was a strong counter-enlightenment. You couldn't do that. Plus, I think I just don't want to say a few words, not in favor of the counter-enlightenment, but there are intuitions there that are not so easy to dismiss. So for example, it's true that historical achievements of great cultural achievements of the past, sometimes were motivated by, driven by, uh, fostered by um, dogmatism, false certainty, uh, arrogance, aggression, inequality, hierarchy. It's not as if those things which are very unliberal and had no, didn't create anything, they did. So are, and are you willing to denounce everything created by say false certainty? in the world because you believe in reason, or um, there is a kind of extreme liberalism which says that all disagreement can be resolved by persuasion, compromise, or privatization of, the, of ideas. But there's a lot of conflicts that are deeper than that, and you can't resolve by reason, and you can't avoid them either. So over, well, you've talked about the limits of reason, the limits of the mind. I have one example I really like, I think someone mentioned John Stuart Mill. Was that you, James? Mill has this great line. He says, uh, if, you, if you tell a man who is beating his wife and his children that he would be happier if he didn't do that and if he could take pleasure in their pleasure, he will beat them harder uh, because people aren't responding. <laughs> human being, there is something in the human, where's Moshe, that it doesn't really uh, respond to reason, actually. Um, so anyway, this, this anti-counter-enlightenment thought, the enlightenment is the great enemy of mankind, is, which seems <laughs> that's pretty hard to take. Um, and, and it's connected to, it feels, even in the 20th century, the post-World War II versions, it always felt eerily uh, unaware of, its, uh, of the echoes of fascism in it. They don't really, and counter-enlightenment thought is acting as if they're inventing it anew, but actually this has been an old story. One of my teachers who was in Germany in the 30s, um, was a guy at Harvard, Sam Beer, anyway, he's a great man. But he said, the thing that the students who are most sympathetic with the Nazis, the fascist movement, the thing they were most upset by, you know what it was? Chain stores. They hated chain stores. You know, it's like the, the society of, because you said, anyway, this kind of, you wouldn't quite expect that, but it's a anti modernization kind of impulse, which is very strong. Um, so, anyway, I first felt a very great kinship with Amory. That was my first reaction. Um, and uh, I liked his mocking of Heidegger's Orphic, hieratic expressions of forest irrationalism and saying that Adorno kind of denounced and mocked. Heidegger actually uh, followed him in his rage against technological industrial society, machinery cripples, machinery and slaves, such, uh, even though it's obvious to anyone can, that can see and who doesn't fear banality that like household apparatuses uh, free you from repetitive tasks. Amory's example is the dignity of farm life with, uh, is uh, greater with farm technology. Now, unlike I think, James, I didn't reread my Adorno and Horror Camera, but I do remember the feeling of exasperation I had maybe 50 years ago. So I'm not sure if my memories are correct, but I think Adorno said, or one of them said, the, um, 
The telephone is democratic, but the radio is totalitarian. That's because Adorno didn't know how to turn off the radio. That was what I always thought. Um, and I think he compared the queue buying tickets to a movie theater to the queue leading to the gas chambers. Now, could he possibly have said that? Yeah, anyway, I'm pretty sure it's there, but anyway, I'm not sure. I think it is, I, but I bet I can find it for you. And, and Horkheimer, you know, Horkheimer has this great, he's, they're also, you know, they're very Heideggerian in this way. I, Horkheimer wrote, uh, what is an elephant for modern technological scientific man? An elephant is only a place where you cannot land your airplane in Africa. So it's a kind of, this is a, distort, a weird view of the world, very perverse, and worth mocking, I think, making fun of, which Amory does. And I think fear of banality is as good, well, it's not the only explanation, but it's a, it's a good approach to these kind of statements. And I do, I mean, just, uh, even though I've never written about these guys, I do think, and this is related to Foucault in a way also, that the best definition of critical theory is a theory that can't be criticized, that you want to position yourself in a place where you're invulnerable to being looked at, uh, and you're, you're not exposing yourself. You write in a way that no one can blame you for, in Foucault's case, you're not a subject, you're not an author, so how could you be wrong? Um, now, one aside, I have a couple of them here. Uh, Dorno, you said, Susan, said, uh, what is it exactly? Only exaggeration is true. Okay, but better way to put this is Tocqueville's, if you don't exaggerate, no one remembers what you said. So I think that's a, that at least is a true statement and I'm gonna exhibit some of that. Um, and I, I, just another side about Sartre, I did read the, one of the essays on Sartre, whom of course, as we've heard, he admired. And I, he's very funny about Sartre. He says, Sartre, his whole life, dépassement, he's going to excel himself, he's going to put his past behind him, and he's making himself anew. In his last phase, he made himself into an infantile Maoist, which was the greatest example of obliterating your own reputation. And then he says this wonderful thing, he says, Sartre is in, uh, in Germany, was he in Berlin, and the, in 1934, and he didn't notice, he was studying Heidegger and Husserl, and he didn't notice any, there were no Nazis, but in the 60s in Paris, he didn't see anything except fascists all around him, which I think is a very cute and funny and profound uh, thing about what this rage to tear off the mask of bourgeois democracy and reveal the fascism. The fear of banality in that is also, I think, good. Nevertheless, on reflection, I realized that the spirit in which Amory is writing, even though I laughed with him and so on, was not the same. So wasn't in, I wasn't really in sync with his mind as I read further. I didn't have, I didn't have the same emotional, experiential basis uh, for saying these things, for laughing in these ways. For example, and I, the thing that set me off here was realizing that I, I'm much more, I find it easier to say that the distinction between barbarism and civilization is, has some problematic aspects. For example, in the 18th century, in the United States, under the laws of war, uh, Indians were considered barbarians because they killed women and children. And as a result, it was permissible to kill them all. So that was how civilization and barbarism were distinguished. So you feel like maybe there is something to question here, even though, of course, if you look at Amory's experience directly, of course, I feel that's, that is a distinction that's really black and white. But, you know, I, my life experience, of course, is different than his. And this is why re reading uh, clarifies our personal uh, stories and background. It comes through especially the difference in his uh, essays on Foucault and structuralism. For here you see clearly that a man who felt reborn by the lucidity of the French language and the French rehabilitation of Dreyfus particularly, felt personally betrayed by the France, or by the French intellectual tradition and the Cartesian tradition. And his feeling of betrayal at Foucault, these French writers, wells up. And that's why enlightenment and despair, the sense of betrayal, the enlightenment thinking from a sense of the tradition of the enlightenment has been betrayed by the place I went to escape German barbarism and German romantic barbarism. He was horrified by Foucault's anti Humanism, in theory, not in practice, he says. Um, and I'm, again, I'm working with vague memories, and I can be corrected by those who know Foucault, have studied Foucault more carefully. But 
didn't he, did, did Foucault say that the normative idea of reason led to the mistreatment of the mentally ill? I mean, I have that kind of some sense that there's something there. Anyway, as we heard just now, Amory describes Foucault as an extremely dangerous counter-enlightenment thinker who has darkened the French spirit and plunged it into an abyss of confusion. So that's very personal. It's very deep personal attack, not by, some, by a reader, by an American who's sitting there, someone who, who felt uh, uh, that there was a, an act of destruction, a deep act of destruction that touched him personally. Human beings being decentered, uh, human beings being dissolved into discourse, human beings as a cipher in a structure. They don't think, the structure thinks, doesn't Heidegger say, die Sprache spricht, there's not, nobody is speaking, it's the Sprache spricht. Strategies without strategists, powers without a power wielder, this is Foucault. So no multiple centers of power, no chance for power to arrest power. It's so, the, the passage from the beginning of Discipline and Punish, his argument is that the French authorities brought the barbaric punishment into the walls because they thought it would contagious, it would spark violence in the public. It would be a contagious kind of violence, which means that the public has power. And that this is what I would call the liberalism of fear. That is, the power fears that their own violent behavior will have, will be, uh, there'll be a mimesis of it. And of course, that does contradict the idea that there's no victims and victimizers, there's no place for suffering. The lived experience that was at the center of Amari's thinking is nothing, memory is nothing, no place for the infinite value of human life. Um, no, no interest in the attempts to relieve unnecessary suffering. They're all kind of, so kind of pointless to think about that. And of course, he's right in a sense, of course, right in a perverse way. Leniency is more effective. I mean, you, you know, you get better results by giving the interrogate tea than you do by beating him in the face. Um, or pornography, which is the American case. They got much more. And there's a nice, this enlightenment thing, Beccaria, in his argument against torture. I love this argument. He says, uh, the thing is, that you learn the most about a person by his body language. And if you're torturing him, there's no body language. So you really lose information. I think that's a typical enlightenment idea. And of course, torture creates terrorists, I think David said. But also, the Eisenhower said, don't torture your prisoners because you won't get anyone surrendering to you. You know, to give them So it's a fit. It's, this would be, for quote, so you see, it's just efficient. But of course, and here I'm not so sure if Susan and I agree, the fact that power has an interest in humane treatment doesn't make the humane treatment any less humane. I mean, it can be that it, and in fact, we don't want to say, I think it would be historically implausible to say that the system of rights and uh, humanitarian norms that have been established periodically and uh, episodically, tentatively in history, are, have been established because of the enormous lobbying power of the weak. That, that wouldn't happen. It must be that someone who has the capacity to put the norms and laws in place sees some benefit from them. And I don't think that poisons or taints the fact that there is benefit to the people who could be potentially, uh, um, who might be victims otherwise. Um, to say, as Foucault does, that institutions, think of them as institutions, as straitjackets, as opposed to, well, as Foucault, I'm sure, no. In, a, a university is an institution that creates possibilities that, were, that wouldn't exist without the institute. You can study ancient Avestan. You couldn't do it on your own without an institution. It doesn't, you know, the institution is as a straitjacket. That's just a perverse way of talking about it. Okay, the philosophical extermination of the subject obviously was impossible to swallow for a person like Amari, who had the real ex uh, experience of the extermination. We've heard this of the person. Um, uh, he was shocked, not so much by Foucault's analysis, but he calls the um, euphoric uh, cheerful heartedness or something with which Foucault greeted the death of man. Um, that's not just fear of banality, by the way. That's a that's a violation of elementary decency in a way. Not, I think it's more stronger words are required here. Uh, human experience erased in an intellectual game, Amari says. In fact, that kind of, the Foucault's world in which suicide would be meaningless, obviously, um, it, and criticism of the author is also 
meaningless. Uh, and it seems like he's viewing the world from a place way above human experience. And the word experience, of course, for le vécu, the, the lived experience, which Amri kept returning to, has to have a place in the world. And it's something that just doesn't interest him. You could say, why should, why should Foucault care about uh, everything in the world? He's talking about something else. But anyway, this is why Amri was so appalled uh, by Foucault. And, you know, the suggestion that democratic society is a carceral archipelago, uh, you know, uh, or, or the, the experience of human agency being destroyed or demeaned into a squealing pig, you can't read, when you read Foucault, there's something missing here, uh, uh, as is the too clever by half quip of Foucault that the soul is the prison of the body. You know, soul is the prison of the body, maybe there's other things, prison, we, should we use that word that way? And I always thought, you know, discipline is such a terrible thing. Like, Lapo is, you know, practicing his scales. That's like a discipline. That's, that's, that's taking away his freedom. Terrible. What a, what a, um, uh, ben, what a, uh, 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 um, now, this experiential background reminds me of, of, of something happened to me maybe, that's 50 years ago. I'm not sure. I have uh, some periodic amnesia. But I met a Romanian literary critic uh, 50 years ago, let's say. And he said, living in communist Romania is like living in a novel by Flaubert. I feel, we feel like a, an insect trapped in amber. And I thought this was like a very amazing and interesting uh, logic that helps understand, of course, like I mean, uh, Amari's amazingly passionate uh, engagement with uh, Madame Bovary. Um, his name, this guy, Romanian critic, was named Tertullian, interestingly enough, that I do remember. I think, I'm pretty sure. Um, now, I'm sure tomorrow, with people with much greater literary sensitivity than me, are going to be talking about this jacuzzi against Flaubert, not just the lack of compassion, the sadistic contempt for bourgeois man without any sense of his citizenship, characters as playthings, mechanical beetles never quite warm. I think that's a phrase of an American poet. Um, it's stunning the way Amari just jumps into the novel as if he becomes a character in the novel. And he's not going to allow Flaubert to pin Charles to the wall like a butterfly. Uh, he even allows Charles to daydream about murdering Leon and Rodolphe. It's a daydream. I think that's a little bit like punching the guard. I mean, I, I don't know. There's some, I feel like there's some relation there. Rush, rescuing Charles from the amber. Um, and of course, it's the same impulse, obviously, not to go more into the book on Flaubert, as his, his hostility to Foucault and structuralism to rescue the trapped and subjugated from the amber, even though it's just a daydream. And the important thing is he knows it's a daydream. It's just a daydream. He doesn't murder, even in the fiction, Leon and Rodolphe. You can't really undo what's done. Uh, you can't really go back to the novel and change it but you're going to protest against it because the right to protest against something that's wrong is a human, a basic human obligation, you could say. Now, skirting a little bit, Susan's, we've already done it. No, there's a no-go zone about you know, torture, and so I'm not going to really go into the camps or anything, but it does seem that, obviously, that Amory's enlightenment is rooted in his personal history and in some kind of despair. And that's, uh, so I want to look at two passages there. First, the great, the wonderful one about the believers he meets in the camp. The believers, the Marxists and the Christians, both of whom have a future. This is related to what you can hope for. They both, there's a horizon, there's a future horizon to which they're oriented. They believe in the kingdom, their, their kingdom is the kingdom of tomorrow. It's a phony, it's a make-believe kingdom. The Marxist utopia, the Christian utopia, it's all just a lie, it's not true. No one who's enlightened can take this seriously, but they're much stronger than he is. It makes him weak. Uh, they have more distance from reality. They are not captives of their fragile bodily individuality in the way he is. Um, they, they think they've, and they act as if they belong to something larger. There's an unfolding plot there will be redemption in the end. Um, and that makes them strong in a way he envies, but of course he can't do it. He, he will never be like them and doesn't want to be like them. So that's the key. He, he doesn't 
say, and here's where I'm not sure that this is going to get agreement here, he never says we cannot face the future if we have not faced the past. He's not really interested in facing the future. That's the strong point, and I think I'm agreeing uh, maybe with Peter here. He's, he's, he said, he didn't, of course, like the way the Allies were sweeping Nazi crimes under the rug or had no, doing things for the future. He didn't like it, and we did it, the Allies did it because they had to face the Soviet threat. It was like, forget about this because the future is the main horizon. How are we gonna deal with, stop with the Soviet Union? Um, and, but he didn't say, I'm gonna be able to do better with the future because I faced the past. That isn't really his, the logic. And this passage, this passage about the Christians and the Marxists is connected in some even deeper way, subtler way with I think the most amazing passage in Jens Zeitz von Schuld und Söhne, where he attacks natural, biological, and social time. He talks about the monstrosity, the monstrosity of natural time because time heals all wounds. Uh, we, we, we forget what happened, the injury fades away, and uh, we don't, it doesn't hurt so much over time. But moral time is the opposite of biological time, it's the opposite of society surviving, it's the opposite, because moral time isn't looking at a future horizon, it's just looking at the past. The monstrosity of the natural experience of time is such that turning toward the future is itself immoral, which is, in my opinion, a very violent attack on ordinary human beings. Or I don't know if that's the right way to put it. It's not, it's, I mean, Amory is distancing himself from human experience and what other, what human beings normally do, which is they for, not forgive, but they turn the page, like Primo Levi, even though he presented, they, and that dispute really is in a way about this. Uh, are, if you're, are you, and he says about himself, I'm, I'm kind of nailing myself to the past. I'm pinning myself to the past. And I know this is not what other people want to do, but it is, he is separating himself from humanity when he does that. And he's saying something that they are not going, that's going to be as incomprehensible to ordinary people as a text by Foucault. I think the statement uh, that uh, or, or biological social time is, uh, is, is immoral. Is uh, you know, I had just a nice. This is proto Enlightenment. This is the common sense, I would say, of the Enlightenment. This is Francis Bacon. So earlier, but that which is past is gone and irrevocable. Wise men have enough to do with things present and future. Therefore, they who labor labor in past matters do but harm themselves. This is certain that a man consumed with a desire for revenge keeps his own wounds open, which otherwise would heal. That's like kind of an ordinary, commonsensical thing, which is, um, uh, it's not that Amri doesn't know this. Of course he knows. He sees this, but he, he's resisting it. And he says, I'm making an absurd and inhumane way, or a demand that time be turned back is impossible, can't happen, and it's absurd, and I'm doing it. Um, and this is, I don't know how exactly to rate this, but I think it's, it's important to, understand, to focus on the fact that when you are nailing yourself to the past, you're nailing yourself, as he knew very well, to a particular past. All attention to great injustice is selective. There is no such thing as a non-selective attention to great injustice. And the principle of selection is pretty arbitrary. It's like where you were when you were there or something. It's not really a principled distinction uh, thing. And, you know, I think when Bishop Tutu uh, handed over the report of the ANC to Mandela, nobody came because you know, the different groups wanted to hear about the crimes of their enemies, but not about their own crimes. People don't want to hear about their own crimes. That's part of tribalism. You only want to hear about the sins of others. And the people, I would say, who actually, individuals who can actually sympathize with the victims of the crimes of all groups, by definition, those are people without political legs. Those are people who have no capacity to rally political support. And I'm sure there are some people here who are like that, but that does it without really power, because power actually depends on your taking a, a very biased, selective view and pretending that it is uh, definitive. 
I also like, we were talking with Yvonne before, and there's a, this is a great thing about forgiveness and the future. Machiavelli says, it's much easier to forgive the murder of your father than the theft of your property. That's because you can never get your father back, but you can get your property back. So the thing is where you, where you don't you know, forgive, because there's a, there's a future horizon uh, that you're, where you're trying to get something. But if you don't want a future horizon, then there is, you know, this is a, there's something about future here and uh, the horizon where you think you can actually reverse things. What is reversible? And Amory didn't think there was reversibility at all. Um, okay, just a little coda. And um, I don't know if Ivan will talk about this, but there's a, it's interesting to see the difference between what we, what we see now. There are all kinds of resentments at past injuries that we know are too highly destructive. And then pinning yourself to past injuries like the stab in the back. The stab in the back, this was a great injury. We resent it and we're going to act upon it. And Putin says, you know, whatever it is, they, they stole the Soviet Union from us and we have to avenge it. So injury and the, and Amari, what makes him different from these actors who are using violence to try to revert. And Putin says that the Ukrainians have forgotten that they're Russian and I'm going to make them remember. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to allow them to forget this fact. The difference for Amari and the reason he's not at all like these people is because exactly because he knew his work and his talk about the past and focusing on the past could not and he would never dreamed it would be uh, actualized in an attempt to do that, to turn back. Even though he says, this is what we are, I'm devoting my life to holding on to this memory against the natural flow of time and, and forgetfulness of time. Uh, and I'm acting as if I could turn it back, but I know it can't. Okay. No, we should, if there's a certain seat where it gets very cold, but I think we should turn it on. Yeah, I'm finding it impossible to sink in this. Um, oh. I, so if we either turn it on or we turn it off, I don't know. If it bothers somebody, then we can open the Well, we can give them a coat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say um, before we hear from anyone that for the um, online participants, Please use the Q&A function and please formulate a question if you want me to actually read that question. Thank you. Uh, Susan. First. So Stephen, as, you're, uh, as you suspected, there's something I disagree about deeply in the last part of your talk, not the beginning. And I really want to emphasize that I think uh, at the mind's limits is quite different from uh, the rest of Amory's work. Uh, for all that um, Dominic was trying somehow to figure out a way to put them together, I think it's actually not a contradiction, I think it's an antinomy, okay? Um, you know, in the sense that he lays out two very different pictures of the world and they are in constant tension with each other and he is constantly trying to figure them out. Yes, if you read At the Mind's Limits, which was published in 1966 as a, just a series of radio essays, you would think his whole life's work is devoted to hanging on to this memory, as you just said. But it wasn't his whole life's work. On the contrary, I think it also needs to be said, although I must confess, I reread a lot of Amory for this um, conference. I did not go back to At the Mind's Limits because I felt I'd read it so often I uh, know it. And m maybe there's something I'm missing in the, in, particularly in the essay on resentments. That is a dialogue with Nietzsche, okay? Nietzsche's concept of resentment and, and his entire discussion of, you know, uh, slave, culture being built on resentment. And it's one of the more brave and interesting things that Amory did was to say, hey, I was a slave. 
Um, and yes, you say there's something irrational about the wish to turn back time. Well, I'm going to give you a phenomenological description of that wish. And frankly, I think you said you didn't think that would be intelligible to ordinary people. I think it's very intelligible phenomenologically. I mean, I was never tortured and I was never enslaved, but I can think of, you know, I mean, getting over pain is a matter of letting go of the wish to undo time and to have it go backwards. I think that's a very normal human experience, even in the face of lesser forms of pain than Amari had to go back. So, so I mean, I think the, the resentment essay needs to be seen in the context of his Hey Nietzsche, talk about slave morality, here it is. Um, and uh, this is why it's, it's legitimate. But I, I think that the bulk of the rest of his work is terribly future oriented. Um, and yeah, I may have read more of it than you have, but the word progress always comes up. Um, the word, I, I mean, he's even much more hopeful, frankly, than I am at this moment in time, 40 some years later, in saying, well, we, you know, we're dealing with this whole irrationalist ideology now, but I'm sure the voice of, Voices of Enlightenment will triumph in the future. I am not sure. But he even says that in a couple of his last essays just before he kills himself. So I, I, I think one really needs to separate these strands of his thought, which, yes, need to be thought together, but are quite different. Is this on? Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm completely ready to defer to your knowledge of Amory, which I don't really have, but he does, I think it is uh, true that he's resenting Germany at the time for the fact that it was a racing, trying to get past, uh, past it. So there's a historical context, both what the Allies are doing, what the U.S. is doing, what Adenauer is doing, and so on. But he does present himself there as a moral conscience in a world that doesn't really have uh, where, where in the world around him, he doesn't feel any resonance of moral conscience. So if there's an isolated quality, even though he says this is all about trying to overcome loneliness, it really is an expression of extreme loneliness and solitude of himself, I think, at the time, for sure. So what happens later? You know, the, you, it's hard to read those essays about with Foucault and not say that there's something there that's replicating the erasure, the, the disappearance of the, the sufferer, the victim, the toothache, whatever he says, is just a lived experience. So, of course, it's at a much more, well, maybe playful in some cases, and it's polemical, and I think uh, jocular somehow, but it's why is he so, the, the emotion which he puts into the Bovary book is, why is, the, what is it, why is he so interested in the and the insect trapped in amber. It comes from that experience where there's something can't move, that can't, that has no agency, that is destroyed. And, you know, Bear, you can write about him in all kinds of ways, but to identify him with something that is kind of a monstrosity of treating, dehumanizing characters, that must come from that earlier experience. Uh, and I don't, if you say, well, he thinks that you could, I mean, the reason I like that book so much is there's, he's not really thinking that Charles can be rescued. Charles can't be rescued, but he's devoting himself to doing it. So it's not a purpose, it's not practical, it's not strategic, it's not hopeful, it's just saying this shouldn't have happened. So I'm, okay, I mean, I, I, you're, I'm sure, right, and I'm not, but I feel that the connection is there. Before I get to Moshe, I just wanted to add as a comment. I mean, this from this yeah, it's yours. I mean, this idea that um, you know this moral imperative, this idea of this the moral wound that exists outside of biological time that you pointed out in the resentment essay. I mean, I understood that as a as a as a way of, for Amari to give moral language to what today is called trauma, right? The idea that there's a repetition 
right? We don't integrate it into our past, but it's something that we relive in our everyday life again and again and again. But what I thought was interesting in that essay was that how Amari seemed torn about being traumatized and saying he was traumatized and being a victim. Um, and I wonder if part of his isolation or sense of being isolated from the world was also that he was struggling to, to articulate a viewpoint where being a victim was not something you could be proud of, not something that you could talk about in public, unlike today, right, where victimhood can be worn as a badge of honor. Um, in fact, it, give, it confers legitimacy on you, where he was very concerned that being a victim would undermine his position. Right? And he was constantly having arguments with himself in this text about, well, I know you're going to say that this is what a victim would say. Well, yes, but I have to insist on it despite that. Yeah, that's quite a, a good point. Ju you know, the idea that justice is a, an emotion as opposed to a principle is confirmed by the fact that as time goes by, the punishments inflicted for the same crime diminish because people tend to, it's no longer so vivid to them. Same crime, the same act, if it's punished right away, it's punished very harshly, and as time goes on, it's punished much less. Now why? Well, because it fades with time. That's the natural process, which isn't, I mean, it, well, this is some moral achievement, it's just the way human beings are. Uh, and I think he rejects that. I think he doesn't, he's against that. He's saying, he's sta I'm standing against nature, and we have this right to do that. I f and I think that the book on Flaubert says, it affirms that position, uh, and not because he thinks it's, he does say it somewhere, I hope that maybe what I've said is going to be useful to someone <laughs> in the future, so he says that. Um, but uh, I think the, the general fact that time does something to crimes, I mean, we're, I mean, first of all, the peoples can disappear. Nobody is saying, well, look at the crimes that the Byzantine Empire was destroyed now. I mean, no one is really lamenting that. Uh, but uh, the past, you know, the past, there is no such thing as historical justice because injustices in history are just too many. They're just, it's the, all the history is injustice, and one after another. You can't cure that. You can't, you can't uh, remedy it. You're not going to make it right. Uh, and uh, so there, it's just the, the, the breadth and the depth of historical wrongs. What you can do is focus on your own experience and, and maybe think I'm representative because others who've gone through the same thing have also suffered. But to think that that's going to be part of a story in which justice will intervene, well, that would be pretty narcissistic, among other things, because all those others who have suffered terrible crimes and no one ever rescued them and who their voices have repressed forever and their faces have, what did Orwell say, the face stamped out by a boot forever or something like that. So I'm, I feel like that's more, I mean, again, I don't know, my, my sense coming from the book on Flaubert and the essays and a few other things I read would say that's at least true to part of Valerie. Thank you. Uh, Masha, please. Well, thanks. This is really fascinating. I, I wanted to actually make a comment about trauma, which I think trauma has no closure, actually. Trauma defies, defies natural and, and biological time, and social time. And I think, uh, just to add that, what is the moral dimension? I mean, this is a psychological observation. Is that for, if I want to make an analysis, Unlike the Marxist or the religious people in the camps, it's not only about the future. For a good analogy will be that for Amri, Holocaust was a domestic abuse, right? It's a case where you're beaten by your parents. Uh, it, it came from within a place that was presumed to be a home. Uh, and it, when that happened, and this is why domestic abuse is so traumatic, you lose, you lose your sense of trust in reality because then harm can come from everywhere, even the place where you protect it. 
Uh, now, the, the Marxists had an explanation, you know, they had a theory that it had to do with capitalism, etc., etc. Now, where, where his morality comes in, he thinks that the only, the only way to put that memory into natural social time is by echoing this wound at home, which he was never really able to achieve. So uh, you think he, he thinks it could happen? That trauma could, could be yes, reconciled. Yeah, he says that. He says that. This is why he said, you know, right after the war, we were we were thinking that really we are on the side of history, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then he realized, with reconstruction, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, things are as usual and as if nothing happened. And uh, and here is. He's insisted, uh, strangely, he's insistent on the past has to, is an attempt actually to come back to social time. Yes. But that's the only yes. way to come back to social time for, for an experience of trauma. It's like, I mean, from my own, my own, my own experience with that, from people I've known, it's like one way of dealing with trauma, right, is to come back to the moment of the trauma and, and relive it in a way that it can be reached the closure. Right? So, and that's what he's trying to do. He's not, okay, well, hanging on to the past is not the exact description of what's going on. It's, so it's, um, the Enlightenment view of revenge, and I use Adam Smith in the theory of moral sentiments. He says, people, what they want, of course, is not to inflict pain. They want the person who did the harm to recognize they did harm. So what Amory says about this is just ordinary. There's nothing particular about getting the person to recognize empathy, as you put it, looking for the, the to finding what you said in your talk, you know, finding a common uh, space with them because they recognize they did a harm, and that's what you're looking for. It's the, con you want to act on the consciousness of the person, and you want to bring them to have see the same. So that's his enlightenment. That's 18th century. That's not a kind of post-Holocaust thing. Um, and I don't know how it's exactly related to Trump. I, I'm certain that modern social science has not paid attention to Trump. Certainly, economists can't really deal with it. So there's some deep kind of sense of injury that, and of course, the, the Amory phrase of losing trust in the world, which I feel, and I, I don't know if Susan thinks he's regain trust in the world by the no, end of his life? Not trust. But, but something. Uh, well, the moral obligation to hope. To hope, is okay. My All right. Yeah, that's, that's good. But um, I'm, maybe I'm too influenced by the poor um, but lovable American President Biden because every time he talks about, you know, the shootings and he goes and he says, he goes and talks to the families, and he says, I know you're going to feel, what does he say, I feel this empty, the hollowness right here. But then, after time, because his son died of cancer, his wife and children were killed in the car accident, after time, you can look back, and their memory is a blessing, so you can you start thinking about them in a loving way, and this is the way he talks to traumatize people. And I think what you're saying is that you can't do that. Maybe are you saying you can't do that, or there's something wrong with that? Because that's an ordinary way of talking. If you have been severely hurt, your wife and kids were killed in a car accident. Just their little kids, and then your son, who you adored, died. Of, you know, at the height of his career, and he was traumatized. I guess I'm sure he was. And his logic is to say, time will help. Time will help. The analogy would be a driver. Drove over your child because he, <laughs> okay, he was late to a party, yeah. and it just and then he's still there driving, Awful. right? He's just driving, and, and in that moment, whatever Biden will say, it's not going to help, right? Yeah. So, uh, um, so I mean, sure. you have to enlarge it to a whole yeah, world, right? So. The only way of actually coming back to social time will be 
an acknowledgement. So you, and maybe Susan too, would say that the aim is to come back to natural and social time. And that moral time, he wants to reconcile moral time with social and natural, I don't believe that. But maybe it's true. Maybe if I could just say a word, sorry to cover the floor. Um, I, I, I think there's something really important about what Moshe just said. And I think it's about, and we need to remember the resentments essay is not just a dialogue with Nietzsche, it is taking place where uh, you know there's absolutely no attempt on the part of the larger German public to come to terms with the Nazis, and and indeed the few Jews who want to mention it are explicitly accused of being resentful. Okay, um, and so while well, I agree, a drunken party goer who runs over your child perish the thought, and just possibly, um, you know, Amory's own sense of torture, of being traumatized by torture, is not going to be reconciled with social time, but at the point that he's writing, the whole society is, um, you know, in a very different place than it is now. Which is not to say that German Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung has been an unqualified success, we know, but um, you know, there's some acknowledgement in social time and space that these were horrific crimes. And I think I've often actually wondered what he would think had he lived to see that. I don't know. Anyway. He was certainly, um, just to add to that, he's, he was very pessimistic in the resentment essay about what Germany would do with its memory of the war. I mean, he expected, right, yeah. Um, and, um, but there is this other passage too where he imagines the, the, you know, it's translated as the overpowered and the overpowering, the überwältigt and the überwältigend, coming together and both wishing that that particular past never happened, and that would be the the and healing. That the heal passed. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Peter Gallison. Uh, so, you know, one thing that I think is Im important to remember is that when we use the word trauma or post-traumatic stress disorder, this is a very recent concept as we understand it. There's an older specifically combat-related issue of shell shock from mm -hmm. World War I, and they have other names for it before that, where people became incapacitated in warfare. But after World War II, there was huge resistance to the idea of expanding trauma in this way beyond its military application. And then specific objections from in Germany to extend trauma to those who were not physically injured or who were physically injured but survived. And Israeli opposition uh, in the early years of the of the state to talk about traumatized uh, victimhood from the Holocaust because the state of Israel revived was supposed to create the new the new Jew the new Zionist the new Israeli citizen who would be who would not bear the 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 insignia of the uh, of, a, of a traumatic disorder from an earlier time. So there were all of these movements combined, people not wanting to extend it beyond the military, people wanting to not talk in, in Germany, people wanting to not talk about it in Israel. There was a lot of, it took a long time uh, after 45 before people were willing to talk about trauma in the sense that we find so every day, so we use it as a transhistorical category. But it's very problematic. I mean, this is one of the things, I mean, I, I, I want to come back to Foucault. And you know, I, Foucault doesn't do everything. I think your account of why Améry is, is resistant to it because of the anonymous murmur of the crowd, the idea of a discourse as a set of ordering of what can go together, what can't go together, is, does not leave a place for what he sees as his essential task. I, I'm very sympathetic to that. I don't see Foucault as a, you know, all point service for how to do history, but it opened up a whole new way of thinking about history through his notion of historical structuralism. Um, just the way, you know, when Braudel talks about uh, event-based time, institution-based time, and geological time, 
I mean, you know, you can talk about the difficulty of autocratic rule of mountainous areas over geological time in some sense, way beyond the rise and fall of kings and, and, and queens, but um, the event-based time does not, you know, there, there are different scales of things. And so you know, something like the, the, the idea of a, of a generalized trauma uh, that can be used in, in states of people who are not physically injured but beyond the field of battle uh, is, you know, people can be injured in car accidents and through sexual assault or, you know, there, there are lots of ways that that gets applied. And I, I, I think that that's partly grappling with the lack of a vocabulary access, lack of a way of expressing oneself. And he mentioned, he talks about how hard it was to get to, the, Amory, he talks about how hard it was to get to the point where he could articulate and it see, you know, what, what had happened to him, which seems to happen around uh, 1960 and the, you know, the beginnings of the war crime trials and so on. He begins to find a voice for himself. And, uh, you know, I think, I, 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 I find that very moving, actually, that, you know, the struggle to come to the ability to speak in, in that way. Well, these are great, great comments, very, and particularly about uh, trauma. But just let me ask you a question. How you situate Foucault in, you know, there's a way of, there's a definition of sociology, which is sociology is history with the events left out. Uh, so how, where is Foucault? You think Foucault understands events? I mean, he has a little story at the beginning, but events as an important thing for him? Well, you use this phrase, event, so I didn't understand your point. You think he thinks about events? No, I was saying, there are kinds of history that don't account for other parts, right? I mean, there, there are aspects to history that are scale specific. And I used as an example, Fernand Braudel's The Mediterranean, where, where he divides time into these three scales, short time of the scale of months or year, which he calls event time, not Foucault, Braudel. And then there are these institutional things, and then there's this very long, which he called geographical time. I use that only as a metaphor to express that there are forms of historical argumentation or Ernst Bloch on the way fields were you know, cultivated in medieval times as a way of under, you know, understanding a, a way of life uh, that has only left traces in the direction of furrows, for example. But I, 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 I'm just saying that I don't see Foucault as saying you, there's no value to talking about other aspects of history. Okay, and, and when he says, you know, the, the mind is, is the prison of the body, he's, he's making a polemical point, I think, specifically associated with the history of sexuality and, and saying that things that we think of as body-based can be shaped, conditioned, forbidden, allowed, encouraged, discouraged, uh, and that those come in not through the incapacities of our, our, our physical being, but they, they come in through our ideas and training and education and, and disciplining and so on. Um, we had the last question for this, uh, this session is from Ivan Krastev. It's something extremely brief, uh, but it goes to something that Moshe said, and this is the problem of the victim's identity. And the problem of the victim's identity is it cannot be changed. The tortured body cannot become not tortured. So this is the appeal to others. If you want to reintegrate me, you should change because I cannot, not that I don't want. This is not the moral issue. In a certain way, I cannot. And from this point of view, he goes to the society and tries to explain that the only way for him to go back uh, in German society, you can go to Israel. This is a different story, but he never went there. And in order to be back to the German society, they should change because he cannot do it. And in my view, this is something that goes with this idea of loneliness. They don't understand that he cannot change. And for me, this is something interesting that I'm going to touch about. Victim's identity is very particular because it's beyond you. It's, you can decide to forgive him mean, on one level, but you cannot change your experience totally. You cannot pretend that this was not there. Good. Then we're going to move right on to the next speaker, who was also the man who posed the last, or the last speaker of the day. But first, I'd like to thank uh, just to just to add, um, he is also a political scientist, also a member of the Anshan Forum Advisory Board, 
and no less uh, wide-ranging than Stephen Holmes. Um, indeed, there, there's a certain overlap between their area of interest, which, is, which explains why in 2019 they co-authored a work, um, the really thought-provoking and, and disturbing The Light That Failed. Perhaps you might also want to add that he was the latest winner of the Jean Marie Prize. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. For, uh, and this is important because this was the reason I read him. Uh, and this is quite important because the people who are here, they're specialists on Jeanne Marie. And I, uh, from this point of view, what I'm going basically to present, does not pretend at all of kind of a deep understanding critic. And plus, I have read basically three things from him outside of the limits. I went with the aging and suicide. And this is quite, uh, I'll try to tell you why it comes there. But from this point of view, I'll try really to much more make how I may really resonate with me and certain questions about enlightenment that uh, are overcoming from Susan. And here's the story. When you're reading this three, when you're reading it basically late in your life, what struck me is, is this not three chapters of the same book? And here is, an, in a certain way, Limits was written 20 years after the experience that he had. He wrote on aging before he became old. He wrote in aging when he was in his 50s. And basically, obviously, he wrote about suicide before doing it. Uh, and I'm saying this because, in my view, there is something interesting about enlightenment, which was in the essay uh, which uh, uh, Susan was giving us, and in my view, his understanding of this. And in my view, his definition of enlightenment and what he likes about enlightenment is to live your life without fearing the future. And living your life without fearing the future is possible because he believes in alignment allowed to distinguish between the fear of death and fear of dying. And this is why what is happening in the camp and what is happening in the old age, for him there was a certain similarity. And this is obsession with dying, not with death. Enlightenment does not make people basically immortal. But it basically created the feeling that you can live without the fear of dying. And this is the fear of dying that is shaping the camp experience and then basically aging. And this is why for him suicide was in a certain way an enlightenment institutions. And he, if I like my, uh, trust my English translator, started to use the German word for voluntary death. You can decide how to die. And this was something that a religious person cannot do it. And in a certain way, even a Marxist should not do it if he really <laughs> believes that the future is there. I'm saying this because for me, the most interesting uh, several points that I do is the following. First, we talk about him as an intellectual. But strangely enough, it was the fact that it was so difficult for him in the concentration camps that give him legitimacy to be an intellectual. I have lived for the last 10 years in Vienna. And listen, if you're born in Vienna, when he was born, and if you had not uh, graduated college, and if you are not a doctor, how you can pretend to be an intellectual? <coughs> he was an autodidact. And in my view, this is the most interesting figure of the Enlightenment anyway. But from this point of view, you cannot take yourself as an intellectual without taking people around you in your Vienna uh, surroundings saying, how do you know this? He does not have a successful book, which basically, before he went to the camp, that can prove this. He understood that he's intellectual in the camp. And here is uh, something that I found really interesting, important. And this is the difference between camp experience, prison experience, and the idea of uh, the role of the intellectual. There is a famous text by Alexander Watt, one of the great Polish uh, writers, called My 20th Century. Uh, it was very much done together with Milos about his experience in a uh, Soviet camp in the 1940s where he was there, an intellectual among criminals. And by the way, criminals, this, at this moment, Polish-Ukrainian relations were quite tense. How he survived? <coughs> he survived by the classical intellectual story. He was telling stories. He was basically telling them the classical literature and making people identify. So he was entertaining the other prisoners in the cellar, and this is how he survived. I mean, this is why he was not killed. Well, this is impossible in the camp. He starts in the camp because in the camp you're working. There is no free time in the camp. 
there is no possibility for you to tell stories because you simply should do this physical work when you are not tortured and then basically uh, it's very important that you cannot do anything useful from the point of view of this life. And this is why the idea of the prison and intellectual activity is totally different in our imagination. It's Gramsci. Uh, people are studying prisons, what called the education and the schools uh, for intellectuals. So these distinctions between camp and prison and the figure of the intellectual and how you experience it, I found quite important. Because this is this absence of any free time which can allow you. And secondly, enlightenment intellectual in the way he understand it, somebody very much about reason and analytical thinking, he's not in the business of telling stories. This is not about retelling things. You cannot play Shekherazada. Uh, and this is how you basically survive in moments like this. This is where your education helps you. This is basically where you're positioning. And for me, this was critically important because uh, when I went on this, this kind of a living life in which you're not fearing death, uh, you're fearing death, but death is fine. You can live with the fear of death, but these distinctions between dying and death, in my view, make it so important, uh, the identity of the victim. And here is, because resentment, that uh, I very, uh, what Moshe said very much resonated with me. Resentment is something that we see around us all the time. And uh, like Stephen, basically, somebody who was doing Russia uh, recently, I have seen also resentment of a different type. So I was asking myself, where is the difference of the resentment with, for example, I have seen in President Putin and the resentment of Amiri. By the way, President Putin is a very resentful man. And here is the distinctions between the resentment of the loser and the resent resentment of the victim. Uh, this is a different story. In a certain way, victim is never going to ask the experience to be repeated just in order to have a different outcome. Victim cannot escape from this experience, but the idea that let's try again, let's play it again, <laughs> and then probably I'm going to win this time. This is not a victim's identity. Loser's identity is exactly like this. And here, Amiri has in his essay on resentment something that I found extremely powerful. When he was talking about kind of his mistrust, what is happening in Germany in the 1960s, it was not simply that the Germans were not facing uh, basically the past, but he was very much obsessed with easiness with which Germany is changing. It was too easy. In a certain way, uh, this was, in my view, what was very much shocking for him is that Germans very easily from good Germans became Nazis, but also very quickly from Nazis became non-Nazis. And this easiness of the story, in a certain way, worried him. First, because this easiness made what happened to him in a way accidental. So in a certain way, it can change uh, all the time. You can go this and that. There is no substance. There is no identity. But secondly, it means that it can go again. And I have seen this, by the way, uh, fear of easiness of change very strongly in Eastern Europe for the last 30 years. You're going to see a lot of particularly people Poland resistance and others spending a lot of time in prisons, all their life being shaped by this. They have personally be offended and resenting the easiness with which the transition took shape. Exactly because it became so easy, their anti-communist or resistance identity became problematic. In the world in which communists can disappear overnight or Nazis can disappear overnight, the previous resistance loses its values. And I'm asking this story because in a certain way, easiness is also something that was very deep in the resentment that I have been seeing on the Russian side and particularly in the, uh, on the Putin side. This is not about Soviet Union collapsing. This is about collapsing so easy. This was the problem, how it happened that the nuclear power that cannot be militarily defeated collapsed overnight and nobody defended it including Putin himself, and nobody committed a suicide. Could it be that the Soviet identity was so meaningless? And if you go there, and if you see basically the war in Ukraine, this is in different way, and this is many, but it's very much about identities. And here, very much some of the thinking of Amery, in my view, is interesting to see what is happening. Because what I see is the destruction of all these 
legacy identities that came out of the World War II as a result of what was happening there. And I'm going to give you four cases of discussions that we had in order to demonstrate this. Listen, the first is a big debate that comes out of a poem that was not published, uh, but in the early 1990s, Brodsky wrote on the independence of Ukraine. And this is a very kind of a nasty text, uh, which was very strongly used with uh, legitimate reasons by many Ukrainians today, in which he said, Ukrainians, what you do, what you believe you're doing, do you really believe that living is something? When you're going to die, you're going to remember the words of Pushkin, not the words of Tarashevchenko. I'm telling it, but it, but here's the, but it is an interesting story. In the Ukrainian uh, interpretation, this is a major argument that at the end of the day, all this cosmopolitan, great Russian cultural tradition is simply Russian imperialism and nationalism of a different side. If this is true, there is no major difference between Solzhenitsyn and Brodsky. But everybody who knows the story of the two, this does not come easily. Because first, this poem was written in English. Secondly, Brodsky, like Solzhenitsyn, was never particularly kind of obsessed with the Russian tradition. He never wanted to go back to the country. So this was the most cosmopolitan of the great uh, uh, poets being born in the Soviet Union. So where comes his resentment towards Ukrainian independence? Why it became so personal for him? Why he who supported the Baltic movements for independence went so tough on Ukraine? Is it so much really that he also believes that Ukrainians and Russians are the same people? And this is the interpretation that you're going to uh, listen these days. But reading Kameri, I was very much hinted by a totally different interpretation. What Brodsky really hated about the Ukrainian independence is that this is going to make him a Russian poet. A Russian poet. He wanted to be a world poet. He always wanted to be like this. He was writing in English. He was very much really influenced, by the way, by the Oden and others. He was in love with the Polish culture. But when he see this kind of a cultural space of Russian language was an imperial being basically uh, totally disintegrating on the national languages, everybody, Pushkin, <laughs> him and so on, are becoming just a Russian poet. And he wanted to be something more than a Russian poet. And in a certain way, the Ukrainians pushed him to be this, because he was more than Russian poet because he was anti-Soviet, Soviet poet. And the Soviet identity was very different than this. And I'm saying this because I go for the second case. And this is a kind of one of the most, on one level, farcical and the most tragic of this. Uh, when the Russian troops uh, entered in one of the Ukrainian uh, uh, towns these days, they were met by an old lady with a Soviet flag. And this was a famous meme, it goes here and there. Uh, so this lady, in a certain way, did not understand anything, honestly speaking. Because the moment when the Russian troops entered Ukraine, one thing that was totally destroyed was a Soviet identity. She was the last Soviet person because he did not understand that there was no Soviet identity anymore. Soviet identity means that before it, for years, there were Russian speakers on the territory of Ukraine who can live their lives without asking their questions, are they Russians or Ukrainians? This was the Soviet legacy. The moment the Russian troops entered, you're either Russian or Ukrainian. In the way, basically, during the Yugoslav War, you're either Muslim or Serb, you cannot be Yugoslav anymore. Or you can be Yugoslav in Berlin, but you cannot be Yugoslav there because then basically you don't have your sight. And I'm saying this because uh, a lot of people these days not understanding this type of uh, destroying the constructions and identities that came as a result of the World War II, does not understand that also in a strange way the discourse of uh, Second World War that is justified have been also destroyed. All these identities that we're talking about was based on a certain common understanding of what happened during the World War II. And this is not there, and I'm going to give you my third example. You have a Russian president claiming that he's in Ukraine to denazify Ukrainians. What exactly it means? Basically, it means he wants to remove Zelensky. But this is the language, forget. On the other side, you have the Ukrainians, it might be legitimately saying that they are attacked in the way Germans attack them. 
in the 1941 to the extent that in one of the villages, a Ukrainian journalist told me that she took two old ladies talking about the Russian troops that were there and who left saying when the Germans were here. But suddenly, and for me, this is, uh, this, is this kind of a uh, strange story. Who is the mediator in this war? Israel. One of the mediator in the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, in which basically everybody claims that they're fighting Nazis, is the state of Israel. And I'm saying this because all the major identities that came out of the World War II, the identity of Germany as a civilian power, the Soviet identity as an anti-fascist power, the Israeli identity as basically keeping the memory of the Holocaust. All this is totally destroyed. So in a certain way, while we talk about Europe, Europe does not have a common language anymore. Because the common language was the language of the World War II, interpreted differently. For sure, in Soviet Union, it was the victory and so on. And this was very much why the Ukrainian should be Nazi. Because this is the only way to russify Soviet victory. If you basically go in the history of the war, the biggest uh, places in which the most people died have been Belarus. Every third person had been killed. Ukraine. Uh, so it was a Soviet Union. It was a Soviet war. It was all these people. And then suddenly it becomes a Russia war. And it becomes a Russia war for a very important reason. Because there was a Lenin Soviet Union, which was an ideological project. It was about communism and it was based on the anti Russian nationalism. And this was a Stalin Soviet Union, which was very much also based basically on the Russian nationalism defending Soviet Union during the war. And I don't believe that these changes and these uh, identity things uh, could be easily interpreted if you're reading Kamiri. He was sensitive about this. He was sensitive how the war created totally different identities and how fragile these identities are. And I'm going to end up, as a result of it, just to claim that from this perspective we're going to have, if we're going to use these uh, lenses, we're going to have also a very different idea of what is lending on a different level. Uh, we have been discussing this a lot with uh, Stephen Holmes, and the question is, are you not surprised how the war in Yugoslavia disappeared out of our discourse when the war in Ukraine started. This is amazing. In a certain way, listen, you have two communist federations that disintegrated. When Yugoslavia was collapsing, the major fear is what is going to happen if it's going to be repeated in the Soviet Union. So why nobody talks about it? And there are three reasons which are much more practical, because Putin has been so much misusing the analogy with Kosovo to justify his actions, so you're not using this because your enemy is doing this. But in my view, there is something much more profound, and this is about the changing identity of the role of the West in the world that comes. The war in Kosovo was a paradigmatic war because it was based on three major principles. We are defending somebody who is not like us, Muslims. We are defending them, nevertheless, that they do not have oil. And we are defending them in order to show how much the world has changed. So this was kind of a war which was interested and important, not because of what is going to happen on the ground, but on the basis of this liberal universalism and humanitarian intervention and so on is a totally different paradigm. So go now with the war in Ukraine. In a certain way, we're defending them because they're like us. I mean, also politically. And we're defending them basically because they cannot defend themselves and because there is a nuclear power against them. But in a certain way, this is a different political identity. And this idea of, uh, and uh, I'm going to end up on this, on this I do believe in a strange way, and I could be wrong. I mean, it was interesting, but he was much more mistrustful to the claim of the enlightenment of the universal principle that can be taken out of everything else. That you can, that the only way to prove your enlightenment identity, you should care only about people who are very different than you. That basically, uh, defending your own does not count. Suddenly, it counts. And this is why the idea to believe that we are coming back to the Cold War is wrong, in my view. Cold War was ideological identities very much anchored in the future. 
This was true with the Western world, it was true with the Soviet world. What we see is an identity wars. And in these identity wars, this type of uh, cosmopolitan identities that were very much preconditioned on the Cold War are much more problematic than ever before. And from this point of view, making the distinctions between the resentment of the victim and the resentment of the loser, in my view, is critically important. The loser is not asking neither for forgiveness or for a basically revenge. It's about payback. Let's play it again, and this time I can win. Uh, so from this point of view, a loser is about uh, the estate of the grandfather uh, uh, and not about the life of the grandfather, if I'm going to use Steve's uh, Machiavelli quote. So this was kind of a very Bulgarian interpretation of America. <laughs> Questions? Susan. So, thank you, Ivan, as usual. Lots of rich insights. Um, there are Hello, hello. Hello, yes? So, thank you for the insights. Are there three points in which I disagree with you? They may not be the most important ones, but I will just go through them quickly. You talked about the historical irony of Israel mediating between Russia and Ukraine. Um, David or Moshe may know better than I do, but what I have heard um, from many Israeli friends is um, that was all for show. They're not, Bennett is not doing any serious mediating and never intended to. What he had intended to do was to get off out of the awful moral position of doing nothing except, you know, shining the Ukrainian and the Russian flag on the walls of the old city because he doesn't want to piss off uh, Russia. Um, so, I, so I don't think it was a serious attempt at mediating at all, and I haven't heard anything about it since the beginning of the war. Well, I could be wrong. That's one point. Um, second point, you said that Omri became an intellectual because of the concentration camp. I don't think that's true, actually. Um, and we forget, certainly in the German-speaking world and probably in a number of others, it was possible to, to become a real intellectual in that generation without going to university. I mean, I know somebody who became the, later the president of the Deutsche Akademie für Sprache und Dichtung. Um, you know, you probably wouldn't get a university job, but you could certainly be an absolutely respected intellectual, publish lots of books and so on. Now, Amory's first book was not very good. I've read it, um, you know, because I tried to read basically everything. But um, that he was in intellectual circles in Vienna. Um, and, I mean, autodidact, he was around a lot of people, um, you know, read everything. But that was less uncommon, I think, than it certainly would be now to be an intellectual without a degree. And the last thing is, I think, um, a little more substantive. You talk about, um, towards the very end, you talk about the Enlightenment being abstract. Um, sometimes, although I'm always struck by even how the figures of the classical Enlightenment are much less abstract than, um, you know, even most of the philosophers of the 19th century and certainly the philosophers of the 20th um, were all out there. So they talk about real events in real historical time in different places. Um, and so does Amory, of course. I mean, Amory is, is always insisting on the particular and on the concrete and on the the um, subjective, but I want to go to, back to Moshe's 
point this morning, um, which is to remember, contrary to the counter-enlightenment thinking that we're always subject to, and Stephen is right to say it's roughly the same song that they've been singing for 250 years, um, you know, the abstraction is inhuman and it's all empty and doesn't have any comment. Abstraction can be an achievement to abstract from all the tribes in the world to the idea of the human is, is a feat that doesn't rule out being interested in different kinds of people in all the ways that his history and time and space can make them. But abstraction shouldn't only be looked as, as it were, draining concepts of content. It can also be um, something to aspire to. Thank you very much. Uh, on the first, I totally agree with you. Of course, the, the interesting story is that for Israel, the symbolic politics of this doesn't matter. Why Israel is doing this is quite obvious. There are strategic reasons, the economic reasons, and they didn't want to sanction. At the same time, they didn't want to look as they don't want to join the sanctions of the Western world. And by the way, President Putin was one of the most Israeli-friendly leaders you can imagine. But this is the interesting story. This is the end of the Israeli identity, believing that for them symbolic politics, as somebody who basically is guaranteeing the central importance of the Holocaust and all this talk about Nazis, who is fascist, who is not fascist, suddenly Israeli said, we are not interested in this part of the conversation. And of course, Lavrov did his best when he basically said that uh, Hitler was also partially Jewish, in order to make all this work just farcical to the extent that you cannot comment anymore. But this is what I mean by certain type of a World War II legacy that was part of the Cold War is over. For the Israelis, this is not as important anymore. They can afford this. And by the way, this is also very interesting in the discourse of President Zelensky. President Zelensky, everybody is talking about his Jewishness just to show uh, the lack of ethnic nationalism, which, by the way, is true. But the most interesting is for him, the model is Israel. Israel? Israel. He said basically that he said Ukraine because of a democracy in war. So it's not uh, about this and that. I'm saying this because I always believe that what we're seeing in the last years is this movement from the Jewish century to the Israeli century. Uh, and the Jewish century being very much about very much rooted in the Enlightenment, that the emancipation of any kind of a nation is possible only by the emancipation of everybody. And then to a story that in a certain way this type of a national identity, tribal identities and so on, they matter. And the problem is how they're going to be organized. And from this point of view, you're going to see this, of course, in Eastern Europe, very popular. You have traditional political groups and parties that historically was very anti-Semitic and very pro-Israelis at the same time, because they didn't like Jews when they're in their countries, but they basically really believe that if there is a country that has achieved East European dream for national sovereignty autonomy, this is Israel. Economically successful, militarily powerful, and in a certain way an ethnic democracy. Uh, and I do believe this is an interesting story which allows us to read differently basically what is going on. On your second question, listen, you know so much more than me on this. Uh, uh, simply, for me, the interesting story, because Amiri is a very sensitive person, calling himself an intellectual. Some people easily can do it. Uh, but it was in the camp, and basically because of his experience in the camp, that he knew that he is intellectual. Because this was how he experienced the world, and by the way, how others have been treating him there. Uh, uh, this is why, but it, it is probably a long, uh, wrong argument. I easily go, uh, go with you. And then on this idea of human, and this is the story, and I do believe this is the tragedy of people like Brodsky. In the moment when identity politics takes over ideological politics, it's very difficult to distinguish between imperial and universal. Between imperial and universal. Listen, when, uh, when Brodsky said, oh, you're going to read Pushkin and not Taras Boba, you're not going to read Pushkin if you're seeing the death from the Russian gun. You're going to read Taras Boba. Uh, not Taras Tar Shevchenko, I'm sorry. You're going to read Taras Shevchenko. And this is what is happening. And from this point of view, in the moment of identity politics, universalism becomes suspicious. It becomes suspicious because you basically said, is this about humanity? 
above national or it is about rejecting other people to have the national identity that others have. And this is what I had in mind here. Yeah. Stephen Holmes. Yeah, so it's, I think it's pretty clear that the Russian attack on Ukraine does, has nothing to do with ideology. Yeah. It's about identity. It's about you are actually us. You may not admit it. You don't want to admit it. But you are like us. And they're saying, no, we're not like you. So it is about that. But the idea that identity wars have no future reference I think needs to be deepened a bit because there is a way in which Putin seems to be afraid of the next generation. That is, uh, his desire to kind of exor the exorcism of the West because the younger people are going to be tempted by this. And part of what's happening seems to be that he wants to saddle Russia with a, an adventure, a, a bleeding wound that future generations can't get out of. It's a kind of, he's giving them, putting them in a situation where they can't escape. So say something a little bit more about how the future and generational relations are affected by these identity wars. Listen, uh, first President Putin is totally obsessed with the American cultural wars. One of the first comments that he did basically, he identified Russia with cancelling Russia with uh, the rollings, cancelling and so on. And part of it is, in my view, something that America has noticed. This is the easiness of change. The easiness with which you can become from men, women, the easiness from which you can become from Russian and Ukrainians. This kind of a, this type of identity, it basically means that if you're a leader of a regime that does not have a succession mechanism, in a, one of uh, Putin's uh, closest advisors once said something that I never said hurt anything so fatalistic. He said, if there is no Putin, there is no Russia. So, but if he's right, even President Putin is not immortal. So if this is the case, what is the legacy? What is kind of an identity that you can have? And then you should try to insist that they're almost biological identities which are keeping civilizations and others. And we have been talking a lot about this. And for me, this is kind of uh, probably it's going to be interesting to share this. But uh, people now, when they talk that there is a colonial war, they believe that it's about land. It's not about land. It's about people. Uh, uh, Russia is quite a big place. Uh, mm -hmm. No, no, they have quite a lot of land. Uh, the problem is that there is not enough Russians. So three months before the war, on several occasions, President Putin was making one and the same statement. He was quoting the famous Russian chemist from the 19th century, Mendeleev, who said that in year 2001, there are going to be 500 million Russians in the world. 500 million Russians in the world, they should be in year 2001. This is what Mendeleev said at the end of the 19th century. But they are now 150 million. And he explained this with revolution, with war, with this and that. But this fact that you have a demographically declining country with a huge space explain a situation which we're seeing in Ukraine today. This is about basically capturing people. Uh, you're moving people within Russia. We're talking about more than a million and a half people. We're talking particularly about capturing children, 180,000, and a lot of them being orphans. And they came with a special legislation allowing for fast adoption of kids. Uh, and thanks to, uh, to Stephen, I learned about something that is called morning wars. Morning wars were taken in a kind of a pre-colonial period in the United States. This was between some of the Iroquesi tribes, in which you are attacking the other tribe because you want to get their women and children, because you don't have enough people in your tribe. And I do believe that this type of a demographically driven wars are critically important in aging and shrinking societies. Listen, Russia lost, they have one million excess deaths as the result of COVID. This is big, by the way. Why I, I can talk a lot about what is happening with Russian demography, but this is changing the imagination. And President Putin himself was obsessed with Russia's demography. He was talking a lot about this. He believed that his major achievement in the first 10 years is that he reversed the process, and then the process basically was reversed again in a negative story. 
So this type of idea of population, and then you don't need Russians. You need Russians, and there are no kids. And the only way to go close to Mendeleev is if Ukrainians are Russians, if both Russians are Russians. Uh, and I don't believe this understanding of a kind of a war is driven by the demographic imagination. And here comes Stephen's story. We have a lot of uh, data about the support for the war. The support for the war is much lower among the younger population, but also for very obvious reasons. They're the only one that should fight. Uh, and, and this is a strange story. This is not simply a kind of a cultural choices that they don't understand exactly. By the way, this is not that they like the West. There is at the moment he managed to consolidate, but they don't want to fight. Uh, so they don't want to fight. And in my view, this is the story, and this is also the paradox of an ethnic identity war in which 40% of the troops are coming from ethnic groups that has nothing to do with uh, the Slavic population. You had people coming from Altai, Buryatia, and so on, who are killing Ukrainians to convince them that they are Russians. Uh, 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 so I'm saying all this because from this point of view, this identity politics is becoming critically important, but it puts in a very difficult corner the idea of humanity as a whole, because suddenly, from the point of view of the Ukrainians, Brodsky cannot be a universal great world poet, which in my view he is. He's immediately becoming Russian imperialist who wants them to read Pushkin and not Shevchenko. And this is type of a position that in my view is very, very difficult to be sustained. So you would think that if he, if he wants to like, if, if, it's very interesting. If, if Putin is after population gain, uh, then he can't possibly settle just for Donetsk and Luhansk because their population before the war was maybe two and a half million together. At now, it's probably a million and a half, a million. So they can't, that won't add very much to 160 million. So if the population of the Ukraine was 40 million, now 10 million have left, so 30 million, that's a significant number. You would, you would predict that he would want all of Ukraine. No, I don't believe that he can do it anymore. This is a different story, what you want and what you can do. Uh, but uh, the other story is that uh, uh, depopulation of Ukraine, because Ukraine's demographic dynamics is not better than Russia. So, uh, and this is one of the interesting questions which is going far away from our talk on Amiri. And this is the questions, who is losing from a prolonged conflict? If you're going to have uh, Keep in mind that uh, around 56% of all Ukrainian kids are now outside of Ukraine. Sorry. 56% of all Ukrainian children under 14 are outside of Ukraine. Uh, because most of the people that we have in Poland and other countries, this is basically women with kids because uh, uh, young men do not have uh, basically the legal right to leave the country. But if this kind of a uh, children go to Austrian or German school and they stay for more than one year, the likelihood that the family goes back is going to be significantly reduced, plus you keep in mind this is a country which is destroyed in a dramatic way. So you can end up with this depopulation, and I'm saying this because what really triggered uh, uh, kind of reading uh, uh, Amiri, which was very much interesting for me, was exactly this what you're realizing and also what come very much from Moshe is they're different resentments. The resentment of the victim who cannot change his identity and the resentment of the loser who believes that he lost by accident, by chance. Uh, he cannot, he can never forgive that in a certain way those before him allowed this to happen, so we should try again. Uh, the CIA director, Bill Burns, called, and he's probably one of the best that basically knows Russia and President Putin, he called uh, Putin the apostle of the payback. Uh, and this is the story, we should try again. It could be different this time. So this is not that we want a new Cold War, we try to reenact it. But because we are reenacting the World War II, the Cold War, suddenly the future disappears because basically we are very much in a kind of a restaging games. But these restaging games are destroying the experiences behind it. 
And from this point of view, this was quite interesting because uh, Tony Jar has something that I found very profound. He said, the problem of the modern world is that we are not interested in history, only in the lessons of history. So we are repeating never again and so on, but you're never interested anymore how it happened, what it means, what was the experience. Uh, this is, uh, from, uh, from this point of view, history was replaced by sociology, if we're going to trust the definition that Stephen gave um, Yeah, the question. Yeah. About an asset board called So I'm wondering about this distinction between the two resentments, and it, and it seems to me that if we were to apply it to Ukraine, it wouldn't quite fit because you could claim that Ukraine was a victim of Russia slash the Soviet Union big time, and certainly there is a way of telling that history that that would highlight that. Um, but what they succeeded is precisely to change their identity, right? They, they kind of, or at least that's the story that we like to hear in the West, right? That they embraced the West, they rejected that, they said, no, we are going to be different, we can be different, we are, we are Western, we are European, we stand for democracy, yes, there is corruption, but we are going to deal with so on. And, and that you could read the Russian response as resentment precisely you managed to do what we tried and failed to do, right? There was a pro-democratic, pro-liberal moment in Russia of which President Putin was a part, maybe a leader, that failed. So, so I'm wondering whether, um, whether the, the identity-based resentment is the, as, as, as fatal as, as you claim it is and whether Russian resentment is really one calling for revenge. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, no, uh, first of all, I'm talking about Putin's sense of resentment. Uh, uh, Ukrainians is not a loser's resentment. It's a victim, but in different story, and I'm going to make. Uh, because resentment discourse was very strong uh, starting with 2007. Basically, this was the identity of the Putin's regime. We were betrayed by the West. We were mistreated. We were promised things that were never given to us, and so on, NATO enlargement, and so on. Uh, and from this point of view, this was a resentment which on the February 22nd ended up with a speech which declared that Russian people were the major victim of the Soviet regime. On the day he basically recognized Donetsk and Lugansk, he said Russian people, ethnic Russians, was the biggest victim of the Soviet Union. And in a certain way, okay, you can even claim this because part of the Soviet bargain was Russians get power at the cost of a weak identity, which means that in all other republics of the Soviet Union, there were National Communist Party and there were national governments. But there was no Russian Communist Party and there was no Russian government during the Soviet Union. So the center was void because this was critically important in order to allow the Russians to dominate others, honestly speaking, because in each of the republics, number one was an ethnic representative, number two was an ethnic Russian. Uh, so this was a bargain in which, and this by the way has a lot to do with something that we see in the United States with respect to the white uh, uh, groups. In a certain way, the idea was democracy is for the majority, rights are for minorities, exactly because the political system does not work for them. And suddenly the majority started to envy minorities for their strong identities. Uh, suddenly, Russians started basically to envy Baltics, Georgians, and others because they know exactly who they are. They have their own interests, while the Russian kind of identity became very ill-defined. It was so ill-defined that even 10 years ago, the majority of the Russian public doesn't know when is the day of the country, National Day. Do you know when is the Russia's National Day? June 12, because it came Yeltsin's constitution, which nobody was uh, interested in the first one. Secondly, 57% of the Russians believe that the uh, borders of the countries are temporarily. Some believe that the country should go bigger, but some were afraid that it's going to be smaller because of Chechnya and all this. So in a certain way, you have a country which also the hymn of the Russian Federation was also a strange creature because it was the Soviet music on a new words, but they were written by the same poet 
who wrote the Soviet hymn. Uh, so all these identity issues, which makes Russian identity much more problematic than any other identity on the post-Soviet space. And here comes basically the Ukrainian resentment, which is totally different and also one of the important. What Russia did to Ukraine was not simply denying them uh, identity and so on, but it was the humiliation that came after the annexation of Crimea. And the humiliation came from the fact that Ukrainians did not fight back in Crimea. They fought back in Donbass, but there were 20,000 Ukrainian troops when the Russians went with their special operation, and none of them really fought back to the extent that of all uh, ships of the Ukrainian Navy in Sevastopol, only one uh, declared that they will not surrender, and when the Russians said, surrender, or we are going to destroy you, uh, the captain of this ship said, we Russians do not surrender. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, j j just, just imagine what, and then you are never going to understand what happened now if you don't know this history. When basically on the Snake Island, a small group of the Russia, of Ukrainian border guards, who do not have any chance to resist basically Russian pressure, had Russian ship go and fuck yourself, this was for Crimea. We are different. Uh, there was a Ukraine, and I find this important because I know this argument about democratic fear of the Russia, the democratic transition. But to be honest, opinion polls does not support it. Ukraine in the eyes of the Russians was not what West Germany was in the eyes of East Germany. Keep in mind the GDP per capita of Ukraine was much lower than Russia before the war started. Keep in mind that 70% of the Ukrainians 10 years before the war, he had been very positive on President Putin. So, of course, there was pro-Western elites in Russia that much more wanted to live in Ukraine than they wanted to live in Russia. But this was not the mass appeal that the way of life, uh, of life in West Germany has on East Germany. Now this is an identity where it's totally different. Exactly because all this Soviet identity that was lingering in places like Donbass and others was destroyed by Russian troops. Now you should decide who you are. And to be honest, the vast majority decided that they're Ukrainians. Most of the people who are fighting there are Russian speakers. They never spoke Ukraine, some of them. And, and this is the interesting story, but in a certain way this is also Brodsky's story because he knew that the moment this is going to happen, Russian language is going to disappear from the many of the parents that are fighting now and the Russian speakers, they're not going to teach their kids Russian language anymore. It becomes the enemy language in the way the German language was really very difficult to take for many Soviet citizens in 50s and 60s. So I find this story about identity, which uh, this is why I... It's good to say that basically uh, uh, Putin feared that uh, Ukrainian democracy is going to inspire democracy in Russia. By the way, he feared something totally different, that a man from nowhere, like Zelensky, overnight can become a president. This he feared. Because if this happened, it can happen anywhere. But it was not the power of attraction of the Ukrainian democracy before the war. Now it's different. Now you have the proud nation. This was not exactly the case before the war started. Martin Chad had a question. <laughs> Thanks, Ivan, for uh, fireworks of, of possible explanations of the, cry, of the war in Ukraine, which left me a bit bewildered, actually, I have to admit. Um, there you have it. You make it very strongly, your argument about this is a demographically driven war. Yeah. At the same time, you say this is an identity war. And those two things I just can't get together in my heart, head because one of them, the first one, is hyper-realpolitik, if you like, and the identity side of things is a, is a mess, obviously, as you <laughs> yourself uh, rightly pointed out. Um, and I just don't get these two arguments together. Can you help me with that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. Just one more thing. Uh, it, whilst you help me with that, could you also tell me a little bit more about the role of Peter the Great. Yeah, it's a good story. Uh, uh, so uh, the interesting story, and I do believe it's a very, very good question, is the following. If you are facing demographic decline, and if you are basically starting to define your nation in ethnic terms, this is not about opening borders for anybody who is going to come. 
This is about where the Russians. And then, if you basically have this obsession, Ukrainians are Russians, the Russians are Russians. Uh, and this is why you go there, and of course there are many other things that push President Putin to believe that it's enough to basically dismiss uh, the pro-Western elites in Ukraine and basically the ordinary Ukrainians are going to see themselves as Russians. But this explains, in my view, also the language on which he's trying to justify what is going on. Because the Ukrainians were pushed from the Russians to choose between being Russians or being Nazi. This is denazification. If you basically are not Russian, you're Nazi, and this is basically this obsession with Nazification, which goes, which is, to be honest, the level of ridiculousness is so high that even the Russians are not taking it seriously because this is, there are certain things that people. But this story is, and in my view, this kind of a transformation of a, in the 1920s, in order to transform a uh, Russian Empire into a Soviet Union, uh, Lenin created new identities of the republics and basically he declared Russian chauvinism the biggest enemy of the Soviet project. And now you should transform this same Soviet empire which was based on a totally different idea of identity into an ethnic state. And this is where, and where comes Peter the Great, there is uh, somebody was uh, telling me recently, uh, talking uh, to the Russian foreign minister and said, but who is advising now the president on this and that? And absolutely seriously, Lavrov has answered this person, he said, president at the moment has only three close advisors, Ekaterina the Great, Peter the Great and Ivan the Terrible. Uh, 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 but, but this is a different story and this has something to do with the idea of time. And it's not about biological time, it's not about social time, it's about historical time. If you start to buy the idea of ethnic identities as something that cannot be changed, then suddenly uh, your advisors are totally different. And in my view, this is really also his kind of a shock. And this was something that Amiri has said, how easily identities can change in a modern, modern world. In the way, basically, Amiri was shocked for 20 years. People that have been in SS and Wehrmacht and so on, uh, they became sincerely, in my view, uh, anti-Nazi, it's not that simply they were pretending, they really believe this is bad, as if we were not part of this. But if this can change like this, uh, and if basically this kind of obsession of uh, fluidity and changing identities in the Western world, then how we can be sure that they're going to be Russians in 50 years or 100 years? And this is a huge problem for somebody like him. Because all his legitimacy, the idea to stay in history, because uh, I, this is not about enlightenment probably, this is about pre-enlightenment, but we know that people are mortal, but we believe that nations are immortal. Uh, and this is why people are ready to die for the nation, because this is the only way to live after his death. But if they're not going to be Russians, who's going to remember him? And also, don't forget that because of the nature of the Soviet history, after all of these kind of powerful leaders come a revisionist, after Stalin came Khrushchev. Everybody believes that after Stalin should come Stalin. Uh, and then come Khrushchev. Uh, after Brezhnev came Gorbachev. The idea that after him is going to come somebody to say just the opposite to it, this is what he cannot afford. And this is why the confrontation with the West is more than just geopolitics and so on. This is an identity building. This is the only way to keep the country in the way he likes it. Any last question or question? Then uh, I'd like to thank Ivan Krasta for this fascinating excursus <laughs> from Jean Amory into Russia. Uh, he was also not being to Russia. <laughs> and um, a few announcements to close today. We'll be returning tomorrow at 11 a.m. Um, and now you're all invited to join us for pretzels and wine downstairs. Uh, we'll continue talking about Russia or Jeanne Marie. And a uh, final word, um, after about half an hour or so, around seven o'clock, um, we'll be, some of us will be reconvening up here again to watch two short films 
from Peter Gallison. Uh, if you don't know him, Peter Gallison is also an advisory board member of the Einstein Forum. He's a, uh, a historian of science and physics at Harvard, and also more recently a documentarian. Um, and he said that the subject of the, of the films are, are, they are related to Jean and Marie, uh, but they're but they're sort of uh, riffs on deaths and con death and consolation. So you're all, though, invited to join us, but you don't have to. It's not officially part of the conference. Uh, but that will be happening at 7 o'clock here. All right. Thank you. See you tomorrow.